If you enjoy this video, please consider giving a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And if you have any ideas for future videos, share them in the comments section below. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can find details of Patreon in the description and on my channel homepage. So as you just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And this is a sleep story about a man who is out on a boat a little way off from the shore and he can see on his small boat the shoreline way off in the distance. And he's on a small sailing boat. And as he rests on a towel on the front of that sailing boat, just enjoying some sun, with his eyes closed, feeling the warmth of that sun on his face, noticing the light through his eyelids from the sun, hearing the sloshing sound of the waves as they strike gently at the underside of the boat. And that subtle rocking motion of the boat on the water that makes the horizon just gently sway from side to side. And occasionally with his eyes closed, just lying there, with his head facing up towards the sun. He can notice when clouds pass across the sun's face. As the dark shadow passes across his eyes and a coolness sets in on his cheeks before that cloud passes over and the warmth of the sun warms up his cheeks again. And as he rests there on this boat, enjoying the peace and quiet of relaxing, lying down, well away from the shore, no one else around, just peace and calmness, just the occasional sound of gulls in the air, the slight sound of the breeze in the background, the occasional sound from the movement of the boat, and that slight lapping sound at the underside of the boat. He finds himself drifting and floating into the most comfortable reverie. And as he begins to drift into the most comfortable reverie, he starts to have this sense of relaxing back against the trunk of a grand oak tree. And the oak tree is towering high overhead, and there's some mottled sunlight managing to work its way through the leaves and branches of the tree, and as he rests there against that tree, he can notice the dancing light against his closed eyes. And while he listens to the sound of the slightly moving branches and leaves overhead of the tree, he can also hear 
rustling from other trees, distant sounds of children playing in a park, the sounds of birds, the occasional sound of distant dogs. And he finds resting here in this park so incredibly peaceful and relaxing. And while he rests there, he can breathe in that fresh air, cooled by the shade of the tree, and breathe out any stresses from the day, finding himself almost breathing in peace and comfort and calmness. And after a little while of just resting here under this tree, he gently opens his eyes, and his eyes have to adapt for a moment to the brightness of the day, although he's largely sat in shade. And as he turns his head to face forward, so the mottled light is no longer in his eyes. It's just coming down towards his head and his forehead. As he looks out from under this grand oak tree, over the most beautiful lush green grass, trees in the distance, seeing people walking, children playing off in the distance. And he takes the hand drum from beside him. He crosses his legs, sits up a little straighter, resting his back, against the bark of that tree. And starts gently tapping on the notes of the drum, feeling the sensation of each strike with his thumb on the different notes. And he starts off playing each note once, the notes on the left hand side with his left thumb, the notes on the right hand side with his right thumb. And then he taps the middle note with one thumb and then the other, before beginning to instinctively play whatever rhythm comes to mind, tapping with one thumb, then tapping with another, then tapping with one thumb, then tapping with another, gently beating out a relaxing rhythm, hearing the sound of that hand drum reverberating and playing around him, almost enveloping him in this most beautiful sound, almost having a hypnotic experience as if he becomes one with the drum, one with the music, feeling a connection with nature while he just rests there playing. And he just plays his feelings, plays at the rate of his breathing, of his pulse, and gradually slows down his playing to help guide his own breathing and pulse to be slowing down and relaxing. And he just sits there in a reverie, playing that drum for a little while, until he knows that it's time to move on. And he places that drum in a bag, puts that bag on his back, 
and heads away from the tree, walks out into the park, feeling each footstep as he takes it across that grass, feeling the slight breeze on his cheeks while he walks through the park. And after a little while he finds his way to the exit of the park, leaves through that exit, walks down a footpath lined with hedges and trees. And he can watch as the butterflies and bees fly into the plants along the hedges. And birds fly down and grab berries from some of those bushes. And after walking for a little while along this footpath, undulating over gentle hills. He reaches a turning, walks down that turning, following a new path towards the most beautiful cottage with the most incredible garden. He heads towards the gentle gate of that cottage, carefully opens that small gate, walks through the gate and up to the cottage door. And he opens the door of his cottage, places his drum down in the living room, heads through the cottage he grabs himself a glass of water, drinks that water while gazing out over the back garden, before heading out on this summer's day into the back garden. And in the back garden, he walks down one side, past an apple tree, and heads down to the rose bush at the end of the garden. He touches some of the petals of these roses at the end of the garden, feeling the waxy smoothness of those petals between his thumb and forefinger, touching so gently, so smoothly, With some of the other flowers, he runs his hand over them, touching them with the palm of his hand, touching them so gently, almost imperceptibly with his fingertips, exploring the sensation of the roses, admiring the growth of those roses, before sitting down on a bench that encircles a tree at the end of his garden, taking an old-fashioned typewriter out of a box where he has to pop it onto his lap, unclip the box from the left side and the right side at the base, and then lift the box up off of the typewriter to reveal that old-fashioned typewriter. And with that typewriter resting on his lap, he inserts a sheet of paper. He winds that paper through and then starts typing. The 
princess and the distant lights, he types. Once upon a time there was a princess, and she used to crave fun. She spent so much of her life having to be prim and proper. Now I say so much of her life, but her life has only been short, for she is only nine years old, but in those nine years she's had to follow protocol, she's had to be punctual, attend appointments when she's supposed to attend appointments. She's supposed to stand in silence without moving a single muscle, without flinching, without looking away. Every part of her life has been regimented. And although she lives in the most beautiful of palaces, she doesn't really get to enjoy that beauty, because from the minute she's awake, she has to follow routines, she has to do as she is instructed to do. And one day, this princess is walking around out the front of the palace, and as she walks around, she heads over near the bridge that goes from the palace over a deep trench to a road the other side of the palace, and that road leads down towards the nearby town. And while she's walking around the garden and then heads over near that bridge, she sees the other side of the bridge, this elderly lady just stood there watching, and she's unsure who this elderly lady is, and she stops and watches back, and after a while, she decides that although she's not supposed to cross the bridge or leave the palace grounds without permission, she decides she's going to walk over and see who this woman is. She feels that it's an elderly woman, she looks friendly enough. And she walks over that bridge, looking behind her to the left and the right, to see if she's being followed, and to see if anyone is noticing her. And she's aware that generally, the guards who are supposed to keep an eye on her are so used to her just pottering around in the garden between appointments, between the rigid parts of her day, that they get laps, they engage in conversation with each other, and they sometimes lose sight of her for a moment or two. And in those times she's found herself being able to sneak away, being able to hide from them, where although she can then hear them frantically searching, she can get a moment's peace before suddenly appearing again and saying that she had been in that area all along, had they not seen her, had they not been paying attention, what will her father think if she has to tell him that the guards weren't paying attention? And so it doesn't happen often, but the guards then are unsure whether their lack of keeping an eye on her was because she chose to disappear off, or because they weren't paying appropriate attention. 
and she doesn't do it frequently enough to draw too much suspicion. And so now she's crossing the bridge towards this friendly-looking elderly lady. And when she reaches the other side of the bridge, the elderly lady begins to smile. And as she smiles, so she begins to look so much younger. And she crouches down to the height of the girl. And she says to the girl, I have a sense that you're not as happy as someone would imagine a princess would be. And she starts to share some truths with this princess. And the princess has this feeling almost like this elderly woman knows her somehow. And she says, I've got something that can help you. But to give you what I will give you to help you, you need to do something in return. She says, I need you to go and find me a book, a very, very specific book. And the princess says that she can't leave the palace. She won't be able to go and find this book. The elderly woman says, that won't be a problem. And as she says that, she waves a hand. And then there's a puff of smoke heading back across the bridge. And that puff of smoke manifests into what looks like the girl, what looks like this princess, running from the end of the bridge and playing around in the garden. And this woman says, When is your next appointment? And the princess says that they'll be wanting her to come back into the palace in about ten minutes' time. And the woman says that she'll have to find that book within ten minutes, or they'll discover that that girl running around the garden is just a projection of the real girl, and not actually the princess for she'll be relatively unresponsive because she's just a projection, almost like a hologram running around in the garden, that she looks real enough, but there's no substance, nothing to interact with. She won't stop playing out a part, almost like a video playing on a screen. that you can watch that video playing. But it is just a video, almost like a pre-recorded thing. So the girl, the princess, is aware that she's got probably about eight minutes to find this book. So she asks, where do I find the book? And why can't you get it yourself? And the elderly woman explains that she's elderly now. And she can't make it to where you have to go. And she's too big to go where you have to go. That she can do magic, but she can't shrink herself down. That's not the kind of magic that she can do. And she says that she can help the girl to make it where she has to go much quicker. She says that if you head beyond the town, all the way to the coast, there are cliffs along the coast edge. Up in the cliffs is a cave. 
and deep inside a cave is that book. And then the woman twirls her hand and some white smoke begins spinning around and spreading out. And out of the white smoke, as it clears, is the most incredible unicorn. And the princess climbs onto the back of the unicorn. And this woman says, be back here in eight minutes, or they'll know that that girl running around the garden isn't you. And the princess is just excited to be on an adventure and riding a unicorn. And so she rides that unicorn. She heads all the way down towards the town. And then with a nudge in the side of the unicorn with her feet, the unicorn leaps off the ground and almost on a rainbow flies up over the town accelerates off towards the coast in what seems like no time at all. The unicorn arrives at the coast, lands on the cliff edge, and gently walks along the cliff edge. And the princess is aware that the unicorn is going to have to fly along in front of the cliff so that she can see where that cave is. So she turns the unicorn off the cliff. It leaps off the cliff and starts riding almost like on a cushion of air. And it heads along the front of the cliff. And the girl can see this small hole in the cliff. And the unicorn pulls alongside that small hole. And the princess carefully climbs over to the cliff and squeezes herself in that incredibly tight hole that seems like it would be barely big enough for a rabbit. She squeezes herself in through that hole into the cliff. She wonders how easy it'll be to get back out again and once she's through the hole, she has to crawl on her belly. And she continues crawling and crawling on her belly, deeper and deeper in this cave. And she's aware there's no way the woman would have been able to fit in here. The only way someone could fit is if they were a child. And so she crawls further and further. She's aware that the time is passing by. And after some time, suddenly she reaches the end of this tunnel and it opens out into a larger chamber. And she drops down into this larger chamber with a bit of a thud. She can hear the wind echoing around the chamber, blowing in through that hole. She can hear the distant sound of the waves of the ocean reverberating into the chamber. And she walks around in this dark chamber with only the faintest light coming in through the hole that she has just crawled through. And then she gets startled and jumps a little. And realising what she was startled by and jumped a little by was her own reflection. And she notices that the walls of this chamber are mirrors. She runs her fingers over the glass of the mirrors. Feels the smoothness and the coolness 
of those mirrors. And then heads towards where the centre of the chamber would be. And in the centre of the chamber, she finds a plinth, and on that plinth, she can notice that there's a book. And she has to look slightly away from everything that she's trying to see, so that her peripheral vision can see it better whenever she tries to look directly at anything. It's almost as if it vanishes. And she picks up that book and she's curious what it is that the elderly lady would want with this book. What is so important about this book? And once she's got that book, which feels heavy, and it's a substantial sized book that she has to hold in two hands, she heads back to that hole, following the faint light. She reaches up on tiptoes, places the book up through the hole, pushes the book a little way into the hole, before grabbing the edge and managing with all her might and struggling with her feet against the side of the cave to pull herself up into that hole. She then crawls back through it, pushing that book in front of her, before reaching the entrance to the hole, seeing the unicorn, still floating there in space and trying to hold on to that book she puts it under one arm reaches over with the other arm grabs around the unicorn's neck and almost throws herself over onto the unicorn drags herself up onto its back and nudges the unicorn to head back to that elderly woman. And back at the elderly woman, she arrives on that unicorn. And she's very muddy from her experience and is worried that she'll get found out that she wasn't just playing outside and she can't go in looking this muddy for her next appointments. And she hands the elderly woman the book. And the elderly woman smiles on receiving the book, waves a hand, and in a flash, the girl running around the garden disappears. And the princess's clothes appear clean again. And the unicorn dissolves from the head down into smoke with that smoke then just dispersing across the ground. And the woman opens the book, and she explains that this book contains all the knowledge and wisdom of the universe. And she says that she can teach the girl this knowledge, this wisdom, that it's connected to the Akashic Records is connected to the Library of the Universe. And she starts reading through the pages. And as she's reading through, so her form changes. And she starts to look a little younger a little more presented, like someone that would turn up to teach the girl. And her voice becomes younger, and she says to the girl, hurry along now, run back across that bridge, head back into the palace, I'll be there in a minute. And the girl heads back into the palace. And she's told that for her next appointment, she's got to see a tutor. And then she gets ushered through to a room. She sits down on a chair. And in comes 
her father with the tutor. He says the tutor has arrived, and he shows in this younger version of that elderly woman. Who comes in smiling, introducing herself, saying that she'll be teaching the girl many skills, and that she'd already started her education. And the girl didn't really understand, and then the father left the room, and the woman explained that she had been called upon to teach this princess. But what she was going to teach would depend on the princess's response, would depend on the princess's attitude to life, and the princess's abilities. And so she wanted to put the princess through a bit of a test, And now that princess, having passed the test, will be learning this knowledge that gets passed on from generation to generation. That each generation, the wizards and witches, find someone much younger who they can spend plenty of time educating with all the knowledge that they possess. And then that person can help bring good to the land, applying that knowledge. But they have to test that person to make sure that the right people are given the knowledge and that those people are capable of engaging with the training and learning. And the princess has passed the tests. And that as part of this, the princess is told, she will gain more freedom, more independence, because they can set her tasks that allow her to have freedom while seemingly doing something regimented. And the princess doesn't fully understand, but she likes this new addition to her life and the experience she's had in the last few hours. And that man carries on typing, that sound of the typewriter with each press of a letter the movement of the typewriter, the dinging as it reaches an end and springs back. And after writing for a while, he stands up from under that tree, puts that typewriter down, gathers up the papers that he's typed out today, packs the typewriter away near the tree, walks across his garden into his home. He relaxes for the evening before heading to bed and drifting and floating so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And the man on the boat drifts out of his reverie as he notices that the warmth on his face isn't so warm now, but it doesn't feel like it's just clouds passing by. And as he opens his eyes, he begins to see what he came here for. He begins to see his reason for coming all this way on the boat out from the shore. He gazes up at the most beautiful blanket of stars and highlighted in the corner of his vision is a comet that he can almost have a sense of hearing, just hovering in space, stretching across the night sky, 
and the more he looks just slightly away from it, allowing his eyes to habituate to the light. The more detail he notices in that comet's tails, and he takes the opportunity to get some photographs of the comet. He can see the distant lights on the shore. He has this sense that the sloshing sound of the water seems to have changed as night fell. And after spending hours watching that comet, watching some meteors, just enjoying the twinkling of the stars, He heads inside his sailboat, heads to a bed inside the sailboat, relaxes down into that bed, and drifts and floats so peacefully asleep, and while he's drifting and floating peacefully asleep, a part of him is curious about his reverie he was having earlier. And so he begins to recall that reverie of that man, of that writer, with his cottage, writing his story about that princess. He's curious not only about the reverie of the man and his cottage, but also of the details of the story that the man was writing. And so he gives that some thought. He allows his attention to be drawn to the details in the cottage so that he can begin as he drifts and floats so peacefully, so comfortably asleep to associate himself back into that experience, back into that man in the cottage so that he can continue while he sleeps to dream of that man in the cottage and to see where the story that he's writing goes with the hope that he can be aware in the dream enough to encourage the dream to change so that he can head back out, sit back down and carry on typing that story And while he drifts and floats into the experience, he falls so peacefully, so comfortably, asleep for the night, almost rocking gently asleep on that boat, on that calm, lapping water, drifting and floating, so peacefully asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell the story of a boy called Gareth. And Gareth awakens to find himself in a strange house. And as Gareth awakens in this house, he looks around the room, he stands up, and while he's looking around, this house is very dark. All he can see in every direction is black. And when he takes a step on the floor, the strangest thing happens. That the floor begins to move. 
and rise, and he starts to walk to try and get out of this house. And as he walks, so the floor gets steeper and steeper, until it's so steep that he starts to slide back down again. And as he slides, so that floor lowers down, so that he stops around the centre of the floor where he started. And so he tries to walk the other way. But as he walks, so the floor seems to get steeper and steeper. Until eventually the floor is so steep, he slides back down again. And it doesn't matter how many times he tries to walk left or tries to walk right. As he walks, so the floor just gets steeper and steeper. And he falls back down to the middle where he started. And after some time, he decides that it seems too difficult to escape from here. He doesn't even really know where here is or how he got here. He's just aware that this is where he woke. And then while he's just sat there in the middle of the room, he hears this gentle noise. And it's a gentle noise of a little bird. And this little bird, this tiny green budgie, lands on the ground in front of him. And this room seems to have the strange property that there's somehow enough glow that he can see, but the floor and walls must be absorbing all of the light, because he can't physically see the walls or the floor or the ceiling. And he puts out a hand and a finger, and that budgie jumps up, flutters up a little bit and lands on his finger and says, Hi, I'm Arthur. The little birdie told me that you could do with some help. You've been here for a while, trying to find a way out of this puzzle of a box. And Arthur, the budgie, tells Gareth that there is a way out in the same way that he found a way in. And Gareth explains that he's tried walking left, he's tried walking right, and neither route seems to find his way to a wall to be able to follow the walls to see if there's any doors or windows, and that looking around, all he can see is black around the walls, and so he can't see any way that there could be to come in or out. And Arthur says, well, was I here a moment ago? And Gareth says, well, I don't think so. I don't recall seeing you or hearing you. And Arthur says, that's because I know my way in. And we can go out the way I came in. And Gareth explains, but you're a bird. You can fly to however you came in. If I try and walk, the floor just tilts and tilts and tilts some more, and I just slide back on the floor to where I came from. And Arthur says, just follow me. And Gareth stands up and starts to follow Arthur. As Arthur hops along the ground, but Arthur isn't heading left or right. Arthur heads in a different direction. And the floor doesn't seem to tilt that way. As Arthur hops his way over, and then hops up 
and seems to land in mid-air. And Gareth realises that Arthur is on some kind of a ledge. It's just that the walls are made with a material that's so dark that you can't see anything. That you can't make out any details or shapes. And Arthur explains that the tilting floor only pivots around a central point, left and right, up and down. And so if you can walk in a straight line, not trying to head to the wall to the left or to the wall to the right, you can find your way to a wall. And Arthur says, and here is a window. But Gareth thinks, well, if there's a window there, why does it just look like a black space, a black wall, a black nothingness? And Arthur says, that's for you to discover when we're out of here. And so Gareth follows Arthur climbs up onto that ledge. Arthur flies out of a window that Gareth can't see. And Gareth climbs out of that window and drops down onto the ground outside this window and realises that this whole time he was in a brown building with the darkest black on the inside. But this brown building seems to be inside a larger structure. And Arthur explains that this large structure has a maze. And Arthur explains that this building is in this large structure. And Gareth looks around and starts to walk around, but in every direction, just like inside the house, all he could see was black. The only difference is that this ground wasn't tilting, and instead it seemed to have the smoothest black onyx floor. And Gareth began walking around this onyx floor, walking around the outside of that brown house. But in every direction he looked, all he could see was black. And so he asked Arthur, If all I can see is black in every direction, how can I ever find a way out? It just looks like it goes on forever and ever, almost infinitely black for an infinite distance. And Arthur says, well, I came in here, didn't I? I'm here. So there is a way out. And then Arthur flies with Gareth towards a way out. And Gareth is following along, saying, I can't see any way out. The further from the brown house we get, the blacker everything seems to be. I can't see anything. I can't see my hand in front of my face. There's just a very slight universal glow through this space. So I can just about see you when you're near my shoulder. But I can't see beyond that. And Arthur lands on Gareth's shoulder. And says, so just carry on heading forward. I know my way. And after some time, Gareth finds a wall. Reaches that wall, almost walks straight into it except that he had a slight sense that something was just there. And so he reached out his hand and touched the smoothest 
stone wall that had a certain coolness to it. That's what he had detected, that the temperature emanating towards him had changed, and he subtly detected that change. And he walked along that wall, holding his hand on the wall, until eventually he found a corner. And Arthur said, this is where we go. We're heading in to the Minotaur's maze. And Gareth asked what the Minotaur was. And Arthur said that the Minotaur is a half-man, half-bull creature. And that the Minotaur is no longer in this maze. But many years earlier, thousands of years ago, the Minotaur roamed this labyrinth. And the Minotaur's home was in that house. And the Minotaur would scour this cave system, scour the maze here. And would hunt down those who had been sent here, but thousands of years ago. A young lady called Ariadne gave her partner, Theseus, a spindle of golden thread. And instead of Theseus surviving here and finding his escape, he intentionally came in here, tying that golden thread at the entrance. And he found his way all the way round to the centre tying that golden thread on the full journey through the maze and then tying off that golden thread here as he entered the centre of the maze. And he then hunted the Minotaur rather than the Minotaur hunting him. And then he followed his golden thread to escape the maze, where others would be trapped within the maze, unable to find a way out in the darkness, while hunted by the Minotaur. And as Theseus followed that golden thread out of the maze, he left the golden thread behind. And so that's what we're going to follow now. And Arthur says, just reach down with your right hand, slide your right hand down the wall, and you'll feel the thread about waist height. And so Gareth slid his right hand down the wall until his fingertips touched that golden thread. And he then put his hand around the golden thread, just loosely, and he walked along slowly listening to the sound of his footsteps echoing through this maze. As the two of them walked around the corridors of the maze, following that golden thread, still walking in the dark, trusting the thread, trusting that that thread is weaved through the maze to the exit just calmly relaxed, breathing their way through the maze, giving all their focus to that thread. And after some time, Gareth said, he just needs to sit down a moment and have a rest, because the journey through this giant maze is so long. And a part of his mind was doubting whether he was just going around in circles or really finding his way out. And Arthur could sense this and said, you've got the strength 
to carry on with this. You are on the right track. This golden thread does weave to the exit. I flew in here to rescue you, and I'm now joining you on your journey out. All you have to do is keep your hand on the thread and just keep following that thread. And the path may have twists and turns and challenges, but it is the path to where you want to go. And you'll be successful on getting there. And after a brief break, Gareth stood up, took hold of that thread again and continued walking through this maze until eventually he could hear a change to the sound of his echoing footsteps and started to feel the slight breeze on his cheeks. And then a while after that, he noticed the slightest glimmer of silver light off in the distance. And he picked up his pace slightly as he walked towards that silver glow and walked out into a moonlit forest. And he took some deep, comfortable breaths of the fresh air out here as he turned and looked back on where he'd come from. And it just looked like a mound in the middle of a forest with a small entrance that was unassuming that nobody probably would realise that inside there was a minotaur at one point. And inside there is an enormous maze and a strange brown house. And Gareth walked through the forest, out to a clearing where he sat down in a meadow. Arthur perched next to him. As he looked and saw the stars in the sky, the illuminated wispy clouds passing through the sky and across the moon. He could see the silver light glistening on a distant lake, hearing the rustling trees as the wind blew through the leaves, feeling the tickling touch of the cool grass against the palm of his hand resting beside him. And Arthur asked, how did you end up in that room? How did you end up in that house? And Gareth asked, how did you know to come and find me? And Arthur said, I was given a message. I was told that somebody needed help, that they were trapped in the Minotaur's maze, that I'm the only one over recent years who's been in that maze and out again. And so I was sent, because of my navigating abilities, to come and find you and help you but I don't know why you were there. And Gareth said, well, I remember falling asleep at home. And I come from a place and a time where birds don't talk to man. And as I fell asleep, the ground started moving underfoot and I became aware that I was in this room 
and at first I thought I was just dreaming, because I had just been falling asleep. But then this whole experience happened, and it wasn't the first time I've been trapped in that room. That often, lately, when I've fallen asleep, it's as if somehow I've ended up in that room, and then when I've woken up, I'm not in that room anymore. But does that mean I'm dreaming now and I've just found an escape? And Arthur says, that's for you to discover. I've got my role in the journey and you've got yours. And Gareth explains that they've never dreamt this dream to this extent where they've got out of the room, let alone out of whatever's outside the room, and definitely not out to a meadow so beautiful as this. And Arthur says, let's head down to the lake. And they head down towards that lake. And down near the lake, a mist with sparkling light begins to form over the surface of the water, almost as if the glistening silver moonlight is turning to millions of sparkling floating diamonds. And then an arm in the most beautiful white dress rises out of the water, holding a sword. And Arthur flies towards that sword. And as Arthur's flying, so that hand holding that sword almost effortlessly throws the sword into the air. That sword is spinning around. And Arthur dives down towards that spinning sword. And then in a flash, Arthur falls from the sky while turning into a man and landing and rolling and then landing on his feet. And Arthur explains that he's King Arthur of this land and this is his sword that the Lady of the Lake here looks after it for him and that it's only him and those who are worthy who can hold this sword or remove it from stones. And that his quest is to find the Holy Grail. But the Holy Grail isn't what people think it is. that all myths and legends are connected and that what you think is a dream is actually you entering a different dimension psychologically and spiritually and that as you enter that different dimension you've been travelling back from it every night but there was a purpose why you were appearing there. And Arthur says that they don't know what that purpose was. But it was the Lady of the Lake who had called upon them to come and help. That you've been struggling long enough and now was the time for them to support you in your journey, in your quest. And then somebody walked out of the trees with a glowing orb in their hand. And Arthur greeted them as being Merlin. And Merlin said, is this the one who needs our help? And Arthur says, yes, this is Gareth. 
and he was trapped in the Minotaur's maze. And I've helped him to escape the Minotaur's maze. But we don't know his purpose yet. But he keeps being sent here in his sleep, in his dreams. And so his purpose must be to be here for some reason. So we need to build him somewhere. To live here. A home in this land. Somewhere that when he sleeps and dreams, he can awaken here rather than the maze. And so Merlin waves a hand and a flash of light appears around Merlin, spreads out from Merlin starts to glow and flicker purple and blue. And as it clears, near the lake, is the most beautiful cabin. And Merlin says, this cabin is created from your thoughts and dreams of where you would like to live. It has the most comfortable, relaxing bed and a meditation chair where you can sit down in that chair, drift inside and discover your purpose, your way forward and what it is you need to know about being here and that you'll become one of the knights of the round table You'll help on the quest to find the grail. And the holy grail isn't just a cup. But that's for you to discover. And Gareth heads into this cabin. Settles down in the chair. Feels instantly at home and so calm and so comfortable. And while settling down in that chair and closing his eyes for a moment to test out this meditation chair, he finds it so easy to connect with himself in bed in his normal reality and realises that now this is where he will explore things, not in the Minotaur's maze. And that he knows his way in and out of the Minotaur's maze now, if he ever does go back there. But he doesn't see that he's likely to have a need to go back, to learn from there. And he asks Arthur what the plan is, what he should do when he comes here. And Arthur says, just explore. The Lady of the Lake knows all, communicates all. And the Lady of the Lake isn't just in this lake. She's in and a part of every body of water. She's in the water, in the plant. She's in the water in the sky. Her awareness is within every single drop of water. And she knows you and she knows us. And if you need our help or we need yours, she will connect us and we'll be together and she can transport you from one body of water to another, almost teleporting you there rapidly. And everything you need to make your discoveries is here in this cabin. 
and Merlin then moves his hands together and pulls them apart, and in one hand is a puzzle box made of deep, dark brown wood. And Merlin says, just look at that puzzle box. And when you've got time and you're here, just work on that puzzle. Solve that puzzle box. Open that puzzle box. And all the answers you seek will be inside that box. That you may do the same thing day after day for a while. But what you're doing the same every day, eventually you'll realise what that is and you'll stop doing it and the right answer will be like an aha moment where you'll suddenly just know what to do and you'll do something different. And that recurrence will stop. And Gareth thanks Arthur and Merlin and they leave and Gareth heads to bed and in bed drifts and floats so peacefully, so comfortably asleep and then finds that they're in bed in their normal world, drifting and floating deeper and deeper asleep approaching the knowledge that when they wake in the morning they'll feel so refreshed, so revitalised, so full of energy, ready to make a change. Because it'll be a new day for a change. And that knowledge, that wisdom, that connection with this new location where they know when they want to go there, that is where they go in their mind, instinctively and automatically, when the time is right. As they drift and float so deeply, so profoundly asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And this is a story about Harry. And Harry is a black and white spotted dog who enjoys life on a farm with his two brothers, William and Cruz. And one day the three of them are playing in nearby fields, running around, enjoying the warmth of the sun, the tickling of grass on their nose as they duck down and sneak around and while they're sneaking through the fields, so they can see some rabbits in the distance. And they sneak around and they find those rabbits. And they play with those rabbits, enjoying being outside in the fields. And they bark up at birds, getting the attention of smaller birds who come down and whistle at them, while the larger birds just seem to circle overhead, not phased and not particularly interested in coming down and playing. And yet the three of them enjoy playing on the farm. And one evening, at the end of a busy day of play, Harry, William and Cruz 
settle down in their dog beds by the log fire. They can feel the warmth from the fire, warming up their coat. And how comforting that warmth feels. They relax down in their beds. The sound of that crackling log fire. As they close their eyes and begin to drift asleep. With the dancing light of the fire being noticeable through the closed eyelids. And as they drift asleep, so Harry drifts even deeper and deeper asleep. And William and Cruz drift comfortably asleep for the night while Harry continues drifting deeper and deeper, so deeply asleep. And as Harry drifts deeper and deeper asleep, so he finds himself walking through the farm, walking out of the farm, walking across the field, And as he walks across those fields, he notices that he's going on a journey. That he feels drawn on a spiritual quest. And he can see the sun rising across these fields. The slight mist over some of the lower fields the morning dew across the grass, making cobwebs sparkle like they're full of diamonds. The slight coolness to the air as the sun continues to rise. You can see a deer off in the distance going about its daily life. And Harry heads across the farm and heads to a nearby track and starts to follow that dirt track away from the farm. He just feels compelled to go on this journey and so relax hearing the slight crunch of the ground beneath his feet as he walks. And as the sun continues to rise on this cool day, Harry walks along this path. And while walking along this path, Harry can see way off in the distance a mountain range and he knows that he's going to walk to that mountain range that his destination is at the top of the mountains among the clouds and so he follows this path away from the farm hearing birds in bushes around him rustling leaves as the wind blows through the nearby trees. The different smells given off in the different fields. And this day is such a calm, crisp, cool day. The most incredible clear blue sky. And as Harry continues to walk, so the day begins to change. The sun continues rising in the sky. And while the sun continues to rise in the sky, 
so this crisp day begins to warm up. The fields that Harry's walking alongside begin to change. And there are more plants beginning to appear as spring begins to truly set in. And while Harry continues to walk, he feels drawn to those mountains. But he stops from time to time to observe rabbits and birds and other animals just going about their daily life. He realises that many animals have started families. And the deer he saw in the fields now have young deer just learning, taking their first few steps while they learn to walk. Standing with gangly legs. And Harry walks with curiosity. And while walking, he notices raindrops tapping him on the nose and clouds appearing in the sky overhead as April showers set in. He tucks himself under a bush for a while while he sees those raindrops pelting the dry mud and the dry mud puffing up from the ground as the raindrops strike that ground before that mud begins to darken as the rain seeps through the cracks into the mud And Harry thinks to himself how this rain is bringing new life and helping this life to grow. And as the April showers pass, so Harry notices a rainbow and some shards of light breaking through the clouds, illuminating some of those raindrops making them appear like sparkling diamonds falling from the sky. And as the rain passes, Harry continues his journey. And while he continues to walk, he works his way round and heads into woodland. and walks through that woodland, crunching on the occasional twig on the path, very aware of the rustling of the leaves above him. And the way the light dances in front of him, breaking through the canopy overhead, and the coolness in here where he's a bit more shaded from that sun. And while walking, he notices how the leaves are getting greener and greener and the foliage is increasing in density and the smells of flowers is increasing. As more flowers are growing up around him, he notices he's almost walking through time. As spring develops and enhances. And as he leaves the other end of the woodland, he discovers a stream that's joining him, passing out of the woods. And he begins to follow that stream towards the summer. As the baby animals are beginning to grow up, 
you can see deer now more grown up. You can hear fewer baby birds and see more what are almost like teenage birds inquisitively diving around and flying around and some birds circling overhead and the rabbits being more grown up. He remembers how much he used to play with the rabbits and the birds in the fields and playing jumping over grass and hiding and creeping through grass. The summer sets in and he can really feel the warmth of the sun and notice how much life there is around him with dense plants and greenery, overgrown bushes and grass and thick meadows as he follows that stream and sees fish swimming in the stream, poking their heads up to the surface, opening their mouths and then disappearing back beneath the surface again. And he feels that there's something about seeing life passing by in this way, seeing the seasons passing as he walks, from the edge of winter through spring and now into summer, and the summer sounds around him, the summer warmth, and an increase of clouds appearing overhead. And he notices that the wind is picking up, and while the wind picks up, he can see the reflection in the stream disappearing as the water becomes more chaotic and the waves increase in height. And so for the second time on his journey, he tucks himself away out of the elements for a while as that wind picks up and he sees the way that trees are swaying, branches are bobbing up and down and flicking around. Some leaves are dislodged, landing on the water, travelling downstream. As heavy rain starts to fall, almost like a grey cloud passing by, and yet there's the warmth of summer. And Harry's aware that all the energy of summer gets concentrated into these more energetic storms, whereas the showers of spring were calmer and gentle. The rain of summer is more intense. He finds that he's learning something from the journey, as if the journey is supposed to teach him something on his way to the destination. And after the storm passes, clarity appears. And the animals come back out again. And the plants make the most of that rain and this stream appears swollen with water now heading faster and stronger through this meadow and Harry continues to follow that stream continues to walk through the meadow 
before turning off from the stream, continuing his path to the mountains. And after some time, walking along this path, the dense meadow of plants begins to give way to the autumn as the greens begin to change and the leaves on the trees begin to turn the most beautiful shades of reds and oranges and the air in the mornings begins to be more crisp again and the sun often hangs low in the sky And Harry continues his journey. He can now see those mountains beginning to tower overhead. And he's enjoyed his journey. He has learned a lot so far on this journey. About life. About the cycles of the seasons of the weather, of change, and his onward push towards those mountains. And he notices how life seems to be settling down around him, almost like some of it's going to sleep peacefully while he continues pushing on. He finds the autumn's very dry. And as the season passes, so it begins to cool down as he reaches the foot of the mountain. And he starts his journey up the mountain, carefully, following the path up the mountain. And as he walks up the mountain so, the ground becomes crunchier with leaves on the ground, with twigs on the ground. He can see squirrels running around, burying things before seeming to go and head into the trees and settle down in the trees. He sees rabbits heading into their holes, birds heading into bushes and finding places to settle down and make comfortable homes. And he heads up higher than the woodland and he looks back over the woodland below. And he can see all the way back the way the sun is glistening and twinkling on that stream he was following some time ago. He can see where that stream enters the distant woodland. And way beyond that woodland he can see the farms and all that farmland. And way, way off in the distance, near the horizon, he can see the farm that he's come from. And his heart feels warm with the pleasure of the journey, proud of what he's accomplished, what he contributed on his journey. And yet he feels compelled to continue forward. And from time to time, as he continues forward, he turns to look back at how far he's come, how much he's achieved. And the lives he's touched on his way here. As winter begins to set in, at first, just the most gentle flurry of snow the tiniest and softest, most delicate of snowflakes 
landing on his nose, resting gently, almost tickling the tip of his nose. And he's surprised at how each of those individuals, such gentle snowflakes, can be building up to create this soft yet crunchy snow that he's walking through that occasionally sticks to his fur. And he pushes through this snow, initially more powdery, and then almost like it's got a crust on top. It becomes more crunchy. And then the snow seems to fall down more, almost like the air is full of snow, like he's walking through a cloud of snow. And he continues to push on up the mountain. And he's gone from following a path to now having to walk through the snow, through the winter, having to create his own path at the end of this journey. And after some time walking, Harry begins to notice a monastery just up there at the top of the mountain. And so he continues pushing on to that monastery. And once at the monastery, he heads in through the entrance. And a monk seems to be waiting there to greet him. And the monk leans down as he heads through the gates, pets the top of his head, side of his neck, strokes his back, says you've been on a long journey. You've contributed more than you realise by your journey. You've been on a quest of inner discovery. But now it's time to take on a whole new role And over there, this monk says, is a doorway that looks like it heads into the mountain. But through that doorway is actually the temple up here in the mountain. The temple was built into the mountain. And when you head through that doorway into the temple, You'll meet the almighty dog. And they'll tell you what to do next. And then the monk stands up and walks away to take their position. As Harry heads over to the temple. And at the temple... Harry pushes on the door. The door sounds like it unlatches, and the wooden door gently swings open. And the sounds from outside are quieter as Harry walks inside, closes the door behind him as that latch shuts on the door. And Harry spreads his legs just slightly apart, braces himself, and then does a full body shake, shaking from his bum to his head and his head back to his bum, and then shaking his head, shaking off the last of the snow. And then a couple of residual shakes before continuing to walk deeper 
and deeper into the temple. And the temple is quiet, with just the subtle echoing sound of his soft, poor steps on the floor. And then Harry notices what looks like two candles either side of a golden bowl. And Harry walks up to that golden bowl in the centre of this temple. And the most perfect white dog comes over. Harry and this dog has the softest looking blowiest white fur and the dog says to Harry I'm the almighty dog I'm the most wise being here I look out from the top of this mountain over the land below. I oversee the dogs of wisdom. And I support the dogs of wisdom on their spiritual quests. And you have passed your lifelong quest. And now it's time for an eternal spiritual quest. where you'll be a spiritual dog, a dog of wisdom. And if you choose to accept this spiritual quest, you'll drink from the golden bowl of wisdom. And that'll allow you to pass into this spiritual realm as a dog of wisdom. And you'll begin a new chapter in your existence on a whole new plane of reality. Where your role will be to work out from this monastery spreading love and healing to humans and other beings, where you'll touch the lives of others in ways they don't even realise, and you won't be doing so for gratitude or for any kind of thanks or response, but altruistically just spreading love and healing. You'll manifest as a dog in their life. You'll find those who need your support. You'll manifest in a form that allows you to engage with them. And you'll support them and be there for them for that period of time. And you'll bring them love and healing before then moving on to the next being that needs your support. Almost like a missionary of love, carrying that healing through into the future. And Harry instinctively felt this was now his destiny. And he drank from that golden bowl, and that water was the purest lightest water Harry had ever drank. 
he could feel that water passing down into his body, spreading down through his body. He could feel his body almost tingling and sparkling with light. He could feel the fur beginning to glow with energy as he transformed into a dog of wisdom. And the almighty dog said, Rest up for tonight, for tomorrow your work will begin. And you'll be touching the lives of many. And healing. And people will just instinctively have a feeling of your presence. That you're there, supporting them, encouraging them. And you'll take on the form that they need in that moment to help them through moment by moment. And then when they no longer need your support there and then, you'll move on to support the next person or the next being. But for now, settle down. There's a bed especially for you. Relax and drift and float into the most pleasant, most comfortable sleep. And Harry settled down and drifted and dreamed so deeply, so pleasantly and relaxed, asleep aware of his continuing mission to seek out those who need help and support to spread love and healing and well-being among others. And he drifted and floated peacefully and comfortably asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell you the story of Mig. And Mig was an adventurer, and she was out on a ship, and had been travelling the oceans for many, many years. And on her ship, she had a trusted raven, and the raven would fly out and scout ahead, and would be trusted to return with a twig if it found any land, and if it returned without any twigs, Mig would know that they're not yet anywhere near land, and so they would continue to travel, and one day, after many years travelling, and sending out that raven every single day, one day the raven returned with a twig with a green leaf on it. And Mig sent that raven off to fly in the direction of the land and turned the boat in that direction and followed after the raven. And after a while she could see land in the distance and she headed towards that land getting closer and closer and before nightfall managed to reach the land and she moored the 
boat a little way from the shore, in the deeper water. And Mig and her crew got into rowboats, and they rowed their way to the shore. And this land was lush and green. And the crew began to explore the land, to see whether this was just an island, or a larger area of land. And along the coastline, the water was rolling in onto the sandy beaches. And birds were singing in the trees. And as night began to fall, so they set up camp. So they set up camp, just a little way from the shore, and that night they all sat around their campfires, eating their food, telling stories, before Mig went into her tent, and gently settled down and fell asleep. And the next morning she awoke to a strange sound in the background. She left the tent and the sun was just barely rising over the ocean. And she went to explore that sound and it was a strange squeaking, squealing sound. And yet the sound had a playful element to it. And she slowly and quietly and carefully headed into the forest near the beach. And followed that sound. And as she headed into that forest following the sound, she could hear movement and scurrying, pushing through leaves, running around, landing in leaves. Then she caught a glimpse of a silver coat of an animal and realised that there were some silver foxes jumping around and playing here in the forest, and that they are making all this noise. And she didn't want to scare them off, so she just carefully sat, crouched behind a fallen down tree trunk, and watched those silver foxes playing. And after a while, she saw them disappear off in the direction of their home. They disappeared down into a den. And she stood up from behind that tree trunk. And continued to explore in the forest, wondering what else she might discover. And as she explored... She found that in one direction there appeared to be a lot of daylight shining into the forest. So she started to head in that direction, pushing on through the forest, feeling the bark of the trees as she pushed her hands against the trunks while moving her way carefully through this dense forest until eventually she came out in a clearing. And the clearing was at the top of a meadow. And down from the meadow was a large lake. And from up where she was stood, she could see that the centre of this lake appeared incredibly dark, like it was probably incredibly deep. 
and she headed down through the meadow, smelling these flowers she'd never smelt before, seeing insects and butterflies she had never seen before flying around these flowers. And she walked down to that lake, And she put her hand in the water, and that lake water was so incredibly cold. She was surprised at how cold the water was compared to the surroundings, compared to where her and her crew had been sailing. And that lake was just so gently and delicately lapping onto the shore. And it was so delicate, and so subtle, that she was able to detect movement from out in the lake, a slight splash from a little way off. And she looked out towards where she heard the splash, and there was just the subtlest of ripples seeming to spread out, like something had passed the surface of the water and disappeared again. And so she watched, and waited, and waited, and watched. And just then, she saw something breach the surface again. And at first, she thought it was a unicorn. But as she watched further, she noticed that it looked like a whale mixed with a unicorn. Almost like some kind of a whale or dolphin hybrid and she was confused at what this creature was. And as she watched, she noticed it reach the water one more time before it dived back down. It seemed to just dive down into the depths. And she wished that she could somehow go under the water, look under the water to see what happened to that strange unicorn whale hybrid and see what's going on beneath the surface. And then she had an idea, and she went back to her boat. And with some of her crew, she fashioned a basic diving bell. And they were going to carry it to that lake. And they would push it out from the side with its makeshift frame. Some of the crew would be turning handles that would be pumping air through a tube, continuously cycling air into the diving bell and back out of that tube at the surface. And they pushed that diving bell and the frame out into the lake. And she decided that it was best for her to go down alone to make sure that this was safe. She didn't want to put anyone else at risk. She also liked the idea of doing this alone, having this solitary adventure. And together they worked as a team to get that diving bell out into the middle of the lake. And Mig had to dive in the water and swim up into the diving bell and the water was freezing cold and she was glad to be inside the diving bell where she dried off got herself comfortable and she couldn't see from within the diving bell the only direction she could see was straight down through the water and she had light in the diving bell she had some torches around the inside of the bell. And she could hear the sound of the pump 
pumping air through the top. So it was cycling around, recycling the air, keeping it fresh. And the torches flickered as the air flowed around the inside of the bell. And looking down, she could see down into the depths of this lake. And the lake was incredibly clear. And as she pulled on a cord, it alerted her crew to begin to lower the bell. And it began to lower. And as it lowered, her view beneath her was getting darker and darker. And she could see that it appeared almost like deep, in this lake was a cave or a hole and her diving bell continued lowering and lowering. She realized that it was starting to lower into a cave and then she saw beneath her that whale unicorn type animal swimming past and it popped up into her diving bell as if inquisitive about what this thing is before then backing out diving back down into the water and swimming back off and she watched as it dived deeper and deeper And she wondered what it was and where it went. And just then, she saw it seem to just vanish into thin air beneath her. That it was diving down and swimming underneath the diving bell. But then it just vanished. And it didn't vanish because it was too dark down there. It vanished as if it had just disappeared. And so Mig had this crazy idea. She had an idea that she wanted to exit the diving bell and swim down a little bit to where that creature was and see what happens. And although the water was freezing cold, she went to the edge, she rested her legs into the water, she could feel that cold water over her legs. She then dropped off the side, taking a deep breath, and dropped herself down under the water. And as she did, she noticed that her legs almost looked like they were disappearing. So she turned face downwards and swam down deeper. And a few moments later, she noticed a slight change in water pressure. And as she looked up, she saw that she was near the surface of the water. And she swam up and discovered that she was in a really cold environment. But she could see that whale swimming around. And she swam up to the surface, looked out from the surface, and saw that she was near the shore. And that over on the shore, was a pyramid and the shore was ice and snow and appeared really cold and yet there was this pyramid that looked out of place just resting there among the snow and so she swam over to the shore she could see a way into the pyramid she headed into that pyramid and instantly found that it was a very comfortable temperature 
in here in this pyramid. She walked deeper and deeper into the pyramid. And deep in this pyramid, she found a door. She managed to get that door open, headed into the room behind the door, where she saw an incredibly comfortable looking chair that reclined. She climbed on that reclining chair. And on the arms of the chair, where her hands were now resting, appeared to be some controls, but she didn't know what they did. And so she was reluctant to press any of those buttons or move any of those controls. But then, around her, it was almost like a reality within the reality. And a symbol came up on screen. And she recognised that that symbol seemed to be asking her to make a decision. But she didn't feel that she was confident enough to do that. She didn't know what was going on. And that symbol flashed more and more. And then eventually she decided she came here for an adventure. She came here with curiosity to learn and discover something new. And that she's sure she can handle whatever happens next. And she pressed the matching symbol under her hand on the arm of the chair. And as she did, so this reality that was overlaying the reality seemed to become the sole reality. The pyramid seemed to disappear and she was outside. And she was in an environment that seemed strange. It was much warmer and there seemed to be shallow, warm ocean around. And as she looked around, from the chair. She saw different creatures and then saw this giant whale-like creature walking through the tall grass, walking to the shore edge, before pushing itself into the water and gracefully sliding into that water. And then she heard a voice saying that that is Anubis, the ruler of this land. And she asked who that voice is and was surprised that she understood it. And the voice just said that it was the technology she was using. that it identifies what she's paying attention to and tries to give her the information she's thinking of wanting to know. And as she looks around, she looks up towards the sky and that voice starts saying about the sun. She looks over towards the trees and the voice starts saying about the trees. And she ends up being irritated that this voice is saying everything. And so she assertively tells it to stop. And as she does that, so the voice stops. And she then asks the voice, If I stand up from this chair and explore this land, what will happen? And the voice doesn't answer. And so she asks again, and the voice doesn't answer. And then she says, 
you can answer my questions. And then she asks again, and the voice answers what she asks. And the voice says, this chair will be here. That this space is protected. Nothing can destroy this chair. That there's a force field around this chair. That's a little way from the chair. That allows the traveller to have this experience. To explore a time period. To leave the force field and walk back through the force field. But nothing else can pass out or back through the force field, only the traveller. So you can explore here, and you can return here. But what's left right over there is left right over here. And what's right here is left here. Nothing that's right over there gets left here, in the same way that nothing that's left right here ends up left over right there. And when you travel backwards, you go forwards to the place you thought you were coming from. And when you travel forwards, you go backwards to a strange place you didn't know. And you can understand this on a deeper level until it's time to go. And when it's time to go, you can forget everything in the same way you forget a dream. But remembering dreams just like you do, forgetting them all the time. But not remembering what it is you didn't know you forgot. Because you forgot what it is you tried to remember. And knowing you remember some things, but not anything from the experience you've had. And as Mig became a little confused, the voice apologised and said, Sometimes my programming sends me on explaining things in too much complicated detail. All you need to be aware of is that you can't take anything from here back with you. And you can't take anything from the future to here. Just yourself. And she stands up from the chair. She walks towards the force field. She passes through the force field with a slight tingling sensation. And heads out into the warmth of this area. She sees that. Anubis swimming off and diving under the sea. She's surprised at how warm this area is. And then, while exploring, she finds what looks like an old pyramid similar to what she's come from. Only this one looks much, much older and overgrown, like nature here has tried reclaiming. And she can see that there are ten steps down into this pyramid, and she has to climb backwards down those steps, down that ladder. And as she can't see where she's going, while descending, she counts her way down, those steps. On step ten, nine, eight, going deeper and deeper into the pyramid, seven, six, five, four, three. She's aware she's reaching the bottom as she slowly and carefully descends deeper and deeper into the pyramid. Two, one, as she steps off the bottom step of the ladder, 
turns around to face the pyramid entrance and walks in through that pyramid entrance, having to squeeze through vines that have been overgrowing this pyramid. And as she walks into the pyramid, she can almost hear a voice in the back of her mind, almost reverberating, saying deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper, as if to direct and guide her and instruct her on what she needs to do. And so she continues on deeper and deeper into the pyramid, forgetting about everything else for now, while she walks and is so enamoured, so awestruck with the inside of this pyramid, knowing that she's just likely to have the inside of this pyramid filling her mind. And she knows that during this experience, her entire mind will just be full of the inside of this pyramid. But she's so taken aback by the symbols on the walls, by the way this almost looks like what she has seen about Egyptian culture, only much, much older. And that there's something seemingly modern about this old pyramid. And she runs her fingers around the walls of the pyramid, feeling the symbols on the walls feeling how they were carved, feeling the smooth stone. And she continues to explore. And then she finds herself heading down a corridor in this pyramid, still thinking to herself deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper, for some reason having that going around and around in her mind. Deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper. She realizes it seems to be deepening her state in this pyramid with each out breath that she takes, with each in breath bringing a sense of calmness, of peace. Breathing out everything from a moment ago and before. Breathing in calmness and peace. Breathing out the past moments. Breathing in calmness and peace. And she continues walking deeper and deeper and starts following these different twists and turns into the pyramid. And after many hours, as it seems. She finds that she's lost in thought. She turns around and can see many paths to take and is unsure what is the right path. And while she's wondering what the right path is, She suddenly sees what looks like one of those silver foxes again. And it walks up to her and she crouches down and pets that fox. Feels the softness and smoothness of its fur, the warmth of its body. And the fox looks at her in a meaningful way. And she says, I think I'm lost. And the fox surprises her by replying, saying, you think you're lost, you really do. But you're no more lost than you. Sometimes you can be lost and then you can be found, or you can be found while you're lost. 
but the one thing you know for certain is that you are here, and here is where you are. So you're not totally lost because you know where you can be found. And Mig is surprised at this talking fox, while also surprised at understanding the fox, and taken aback that the fox actually spoke. And the fox says, it's easy to find your way home. Forget what everyone's been telling you. Forget what you've been thinking. The only important thing you need to be aware of to find your way home is that it's down there, up left, taking the first right, and then you take two lefts, two rights and a left. But before you take a left, a right, a left, right, left, you're going to discover that what's left isn't right. And when you discover what's left isn't right, you're going to know that you're wrong. But when you find that you're wrong, you're going to want to be right, that the only way to be right is not to turn left. Because if you turn left, you're not turning right, and if you don't turn right, what's left is wrong. And I'm not meaning to be confusing by telling you what's left and what's right and what's right and what's wrong. All I'm doing is trying to be clear and make sure you know which way to go. I don't want you to take a left, a right, a left, left, right. I want you to take a right, a left, a right, right, left. But not the right, left, right that you think you take. Because the right, left, right you think you take is the left, right, left for others. And sometimes what you see in a mirror isn't right. Other times what you see in a mirror means turn left. So it's easy to follow the instructions. If you walk down here and you turn left, left, right, you're going to be in the wrong place. And the route that's left won't make sense. So instead of heading down that route and finding that wrong place, make sure that if you head down here, if you see this symbol on the left of a star, you know that that's not right. And you've walked too far. But if you see the symbol of a boot on the floor, you know that you're near and close to the door. But don't walk through the door when the path isn't right. Turn around left and make flight. Because if you don't make flight and turn around with haste, you're going to find your whole journey was a waste and you'll discover yourself back here with me and the last thing you want is a fiddle-dee-dee the last thing you need is to hear the grey fox telling you rhymes of Goldilocks and Mig found herself to be getting increasingly confused and the fox said you're beginning to enter the right state now, it's only when confusion sets in that you can find clarity and peace. And when you find that clarity and peace in confusion, you know your brain can start to create fusion. And as that fusion happens and neurons fire, you can find your way out of this dire situation that you found yourself in moments ago, realizing it's actually a rosy glow, that it's really positive and really pleasant, and it's a wonderful experience to be had, you'll find your way back to my brother or dad, the silver foxes back in that forest. But you won't remember to tell them you visited me, because you'll be too busy having risen from under the sea. And in a state of confusion. Mig turned around left, then right, and she left. And as she left, the fox waved goodbye and vanished in a blink of an eye. And magically, 
so she thought, for she had no memory of what ought to have been. She found herself leaving that old pyramid and descending deeper and deeper while she climbed up those steps from the bottom to the top from step ten at the bottom to nine to eight going deeper and deeper as she climbed up out to seven to six to five and four going deeper and deeper as she approached the door to three to two to one remembering no more because she knows she wanted to know more and the easiest way for her to know more as she walked back to that seat behind the force field was for her to know more about this place and while she remembered no more here she knew that she would know more later about other things and discover some wondrous exciting things as her body while she rested down in that chair began to feel deeper and deeper sat there and while her body sank deeper and deeper into that chair, her mind went deeper and deeper back to her time. And this time faded away, as she assertively said, I want to push this button and go back to bed. And so she pushed that button, and the reality faded, as she found herself back in that pyramid unjaded and she left that chair and left the pyramid and walked through the snow and dived down into that cold water curious of where she was going to go leaving behind all thoughts all memories of what had just passed aware that that was all her last experience here to stay here knowing as she swam back and into that diving bell passing back into her normal time and her normal place in that lake in that bell that everything she had seen and experienced, everything outside of this bell, can stay outside of the bell, and she can leave all that there. And she thought to herself, I will leave all that there, and just rise up, no one will believe me if I tell them my experience. So I might as well just forget the experience, leave it there, and just remember to tell people that it was a good experience to be had, and there's no need for you to know what went on down there. And I'll remember to tell people there's no need for you to know what went on down there. And she pulled on the cord, and the diving bell rose and rose. And when it reached the surface, she could feel it bobbing and swaying on the surface. She carefully dived down out of the bell, swam to the shore. Her crew asked what she experienced, what went on, that she was down there a long time. And she says, oh, forget it. There was nothing important there. Let's just go camp on the beach. We'll find another island and carry on exploring. And she put all that out of her mind. She walked back. And as she walked back through the forest, so she could hear those foxes playing, and one of the foxes 
stopped and looked over at her and made a noise, and she felt a strange connection with the fox before the fox turned away and carried on playing. And she thought to herself, forget it. It's nothing. As she headed to the other side of the forest, camped for the night, and that night drifted and floated to the most pleasant dreams, before the next day going back to the boat, and continuing the journey of discovery around the world. Recording The Adventures of Mig So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice, or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you continue to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And this is a sleep story about a woman who sets off one day from her log cabin in the countryside. She heads out from that log cabin, walking her small dog. And the two of them walk down the garden path, through the garden, where she can enjoy the smells of the flowers, noticing the butterflies landing on the different flowers. And she can have a certain sense of curiosity about how the dog would be perceiving the smells around them as she enjoys the smells of her garden and she reaches the garden gate opens the latch walks through that gate closing the gate behind her and her dog and heading off down towards a path that leads deeper into the countryside. And she follows that path, initially heading down, and then curving up slightly and then heading into some woodland. And she walks into that woodland And as she heads into the woodland, so she notices the way the air changes, the way the breeze changes and the temperature of the air, and the sounds of the rustling leaves around her as the trees blow in the breeze. And she lets her dog off of the leash, and the dog runs and jumps, through loose, fallen leaves, bouncing and springing, and rolling in those leaves, and excitedly running among the trees. And she just enjoys her gentle, relaxed stroll through this bit of woodland, just listening to the bird sounds echoing through the trees, the occasional scampering sound of squirrels, the tip-tap of the squirrels' toes as they run around the trunks of trees, chasing each other round, and noticing a squirrel on a branch seeing the way its tail is flicking and moving while it looks around, preparing what to do next. As her dog continues to run around among the trees 
and play among those leaves. And she continues to just slowly walk through the woodland. The dull thud of the footsteps on the mud below as she walks. That slight cool breeze on her cheeks. The dappled light dancing on the path in front of her through the branches overhead. the very slight mist among the trees, the way the light creates moving shards in that mist. And then after a little while, she approaches the exit of the woodland climbs over a sty as she exits the woodland. The dog jumps up, pops its legs up, climbs up onto the top of the sty and then jumps down the other side as she watches to make sure that the dog safely gets over beside her. And the two of them continue to follow a path. And they walk along this path through the meadow the other side of the woodland. And initially this meadow has steep hills either side. And she can feel the warmth of the sun on her face while the hills block out a lot of the breeze. She can notice the blue sky. She can notice whether there's clouds in the sky. The occasional circling bird. The way the grass blows in that gentle, subtle breeze, almost like a dark and light band passing across that grass very slowly as it makes the grass just gently wave. And the wild flowers dotted throughout this meadow She walks along in this meadow, her dog running off, playing in the grass, rolling around. Then the dog brings over a stick, places it down at her feet. So she picks up that stick, throws it as far as she can. The dog watches as the stick flies over its head before jumping and running towards the stick, spinning around the stick, coming back at the stick, picking it up, and running back and dropping it back down at her feet. And she throws that stick a few times as she continues to walk through this meadow. She can see the bees enjoying the wild flowers. And she follows this meadow round as the hills level out. As she follows this path slightly uphill to a level point, as she begins to follow the path with hedges along both sides and the hedges are only low with a little ditch along the side of the hedges and she can hear the occasional animal underneath the hedges she can hear the cacophony of sparrows 
communicating with each other, hidden deep inside a hedge. And the interesting way that they go silent as she turns to face that hedge. Almost as if they suddenly think they're being watched, they better be quiet. And then they start to sing and talk again as she looks away and continues to walk. And beyond the hedges on either side are fields. And she gazes over the hedges, looking left, looking right looking over the bright yellow crops in the field, those bright yellow flowers that seem to be so bright, so vivid yellow, it's almost as if they're emitting light rather than just reflecting light. And she has that strong smell of those yellow flowers. And she continues to walk along this path, which begins to turn slightly stony and a bit like gravel. And she can hear that gravelly footstep with each step that she takes. And the slight dust thrown up with each footstep. And her dog continues to run and play and seem to be enjoying its time out walking. And after some time, the hedges give way to just being able to look out over open fields in all directions. And beyond the near fields are hills with further fields. And then as she looks towards the most distant fields, she can see sheep grazing. She can see some lambs in those fields. The occasional tree standing in those fields. She can see some fields of cows and is curious about the way the cows are sitting on the grass, just relaxing under the warmth of the sun. And then she starts to approach the lavender fields, she can smell that smell of lavender. And notice the dense bluey purple of those lavender fields on both sides of the path. And you can see the way the fields are so full of bees and other insects, butterflies, seeming to really enjoy that lavender. And she walks over nearer to the field. She runs her hand across the top of the lavender and can feel the tickling of that lavender on the palm of her hand as she walks. Then she brings her hands up near to her face, cups her hands either side of her mouth and nose, and takes a comfortable breath in, breathing in that lavender smell, and breathing out as she relaxes deeper and deeper into the experience. And she reaches back to the lavender, and rubs some of the lavender between her thumb 
and first two fingers, feeling that brittle, almost subtle crunchy feeling under the fingertips. She releases that fragrance and then smells that on her hands, rubbing her hands together, spreading the lavender smell across her hands. And after a while, she turns off the path into one of the fields, follows a track into the centre of that field. And in the centre of this field is a large oak tree. And when the farmer sows the lavender in the field, they have to skirt around the oak tree, leaving a large empty space beneath that broad tree, so that when they come to harvest this lavender, they don't get too close to the tree during harvesting, but it means that she can walk along turn down one of the tracks into the field and follow that track all the way to the centre to that grand oak tree. And at the grand oak tree, a little bit away from the tree, she places a picnic blanket on the ground places her bag in the corner of the blanket and relaxes down onto that soft picnic blanket surrounded by lavender the most beautiful elegant oak tree arching overhead on this small grass area from this position, she can enjoy the sun while resting under the tree and gazing out over the lavender. And she has something to eat while she rests on that picnic blanket. And she gives her dog some food and her dog goes running off into the field and remains playful for a while before coming and settling down onto the blanket near her. The dog turns around a few times, settles down comfortably on that blanket. And the woman takes a book from her bag and sits back in the sun and begins to read that book and allow her mind to be transported to drift off into the story in the book. And she can hear the sound of the wind blowing across the top of the lavender. And occasionally there'll be larger bursts of breeze sending powerful wafts of lavender towards the woman. And then she would get used to the smell of the lavender and barely notice it before occasionally taking a deeper breath in or having a stronger waft of air blasting slightly more smell in her direction and the lavender just helps her 
settled and calm and feels so relaxed that she becomes deeply absorbed in the book. And as she becomes absorbed in the book that she's reading, she starts to almost imagine that story playing out in her mind's eye. Imagining an old western novel of a man who had gone to find his fortune panning for gold and bought a small area of land and every day would go out and spend the day panning in the stream that ran down from a natural spring to try and get just a few small pieces of glistening metal in that pan. And day after day, week after week, month after month, he would come out and pan for gold. Until eventually one day, he finally managed to hit his jackpot and found a large piece of gold. And that large piece of gold transformed his life. It led to him setting up a whole new life where he met a woman, and they fell in love. They had a family. And they then went travelling as a family. And they travelled on horse and cart, heading to a mountainous region. And the man enjoyed sledging, down slopes with his children in the snow. He taught them how to have fun just rolling down hills. And this story that the woman was reading was a truly wholesome, feel-good story, where not a lot happened, it was just a gradual progression of working hard, of achievement, of falling in love, of enjoying family life, prioritizing experiences over materialism. and valuing those experiences, the memories created through those experiences. And the woman liked just being able to sit down in a relaxed place and read easy to read stories like this. And after reading for a little while, she put the book down so that she could just enjoy the environment. She laid back, resting her head on her bag, closed her eyes, and just listened to the sounds around her. Her dog moved a bit closer, rested its head on her leg, and snuggled up next to her, and she could feel the warmth of the sun on her face as she just lay back there, resting her head on her bag. She could hear the sound of the lavender blowing in the breeze. Smell the occasional smell of that lavender. She could hear the sounds of birds in the distance. 
and birds of prey circling overhead. And with her eyes closed, she could notice when clouds passed gently across the face of the sun. And the temperature change on her skin as that happened. And she just enjoyed being in the moment. No worries, no stresses, no anxiety, just enjoying being in the moment. And after a little while, she knew that she had to head off from here. She had to walk with her dog back home. So she packed up her bag, encouraged the dog to stand up and join her, and walked back through the lavender field. And she picked some of the lavender and tucked it into her bag to take home with her. Just a small amount. And then walked back to that path and began following the path home, walking past the lavender fields. And then walking past those hedges full of birds and the bright yellow flowers in the fields. Then walking into the woodland, through the woodland, and heading all the way back to her home. And back at home, she walked through her gate, through her front garden, into her home, letting her dog in first who ran in and jumped up on one of the seats, curled around and sat down on the seat. She put her things away and went and settled down in the seat opposite the dog. And she rested there in the coolness of the room, gazing out towards the back garden noticing how bright it was out there in the back garden. And after resting for a little while, she grabbed herself a cool drink. She opened the doors to the back garden and went and sat out at a table and chairs just outside the back door of her home, gazing over the garden. And she watched as a dragonfly hovered and darted around above the pond. She listened to the bubbling sound of a water feature which fed water gently down into the pond. And the sounds of birds in the trees and in the area around her home. And although she didn't really do much with her day, she felt that for her, this is the perfect ideal day. Living in the perfect home. Being able to go out Enjoy nature for a while before coming home and relaxing in a calm and quiet garden. And then that evening 
she settled down in bed. And feeling so deeply relaxed from her calm day, where she'd gone through the day with very few worries, very little anxiety, very little stress. She found that that all helped her fall asleep so easily, so comfortably. It helped her sleep well through the night, getting the right balance of deep sleep, of dreaming sleep, of pleasant dreams while asleep, knowing as she drifted comfortably asleep that she'll awaken in the morning feeling so refreshed, so revitalized, so full of energy. And looking forward to her next day, and what she'll decide to do with that day. As she drifted peacefully and comfortably asleep, So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And this is a story about a young dog called Rosie. And Rosie is out one day walking with her human friend. And they're heading down to the nearby park. And as they walk down towards that park, so Rosie can follow different scent trails, noticing different and unusual smells following one scent, exploring that for a while, before then changing directions and following another scent, and occasionally stopping to explore a scent in a little more detail. And Rosie's world is an incredibly rich, scent-filled world. And as Rosie and her human approach the park, so she can notice the smells of the different flowers emanating gently from the park. And they head into that park through a black steel gate. And Rosie instantly runs off across the grass, bounding around, rolling on the grass, running into some longer grass and rolling in that, and rubbing some of those scents that she really likes onto her fur. She likes the way that when she does that, those scents hang around and stick with her for a while. And her human is just walking along at a leisurely pace, taking deep breaths, enjoying being outside, just enjoying relaxing, walking through this park, while Rosie runs around and plays and explores the park. And she has been to this park many times before, but each time she finds new things to explore that she hadn't seen before. She finds it interesting how the park changes across the year. That when she first came to this park, there wasn't much green. It was mainly sticks. And the trees were bare. And everything was brown. And it was cold. And the ground was hard. And then, as she continued coming to the park, first 
there were some small, little delicate flowers popping up near the trees. And then there was even more flowers and the trees started growing tiny leaves. And then one time when she visited, there was insects and butterflies and the sounds of more birds, more cheery bird sounds. In each visit to the park she has discovered more and more going on here. And now even the short grass is longer than it was. And the long grass is very long. And where there was just mud, there are now densely packed flowers. And while Rosie explores, her human finds a bench and sits down on a bench, shaded comfortably by the shadow of a tall tree. And Rosie explores the edge of the park, explores around the flowers, jumps over some of the flowers to explore behind those flowers and into the trees a little way. And she knows that her human is comfortable with her doing this. That they always seem so relaxed and they're comfortable because there's a fence that goes around the outside of the park. So they know that Rosie is here within the park, even if they lose sight of her. And today, while Rosie is exploring the park, she notices a really unusual smell. And she's had a faint whiff of this smell before but she's never tracked down what it is. And so she follows that scent, weaving between trees, heading into the coolness and the calmness of the wooded area of this park, away from that open green area, Noticing the quietening down of the sounds around her, following that scent, just hearing the gentle steps that she takes as she walks through this wooded area. And after a while, she hears a slight squeaking sound, and so she heads cautiously and curiously towards that squeaking sound. And as she pokes her head into a tiny bush at the base of a tree, she sees a, a small little animal. And that little kitten looks up at Rosie, making a few little squeaking sounds and jerky movements trying to stand and move, and buffs its head against Rosie's wet nose. And Rosie's curious about this little creature. Rosie pulls her head out of the bush, and looks around, and she can't smell any other animal like this animal. And as she's looking around, she hears a twinkling, sparkling sound. And then almost as if 
it's come out of the tree trunk, through the tree trunk. She sees some sparkling light that's incredibly bright. And as that sparkling light lowers down towards her, the brightness of the light begins to dim. And she notices what looks like a small person with wings. And this fairy hovers near to Rosie and says, I need your help. The mum cat of this kitten has entered the land of the fairies. And the kitten needs the mum. And the mum can't find her way out from the land of the fairies. And is lost in that land. And as a fairy I can find my way out. Using magic we come and go through magical portals that have us move from one realm to another. But we can't take someone else through that portal. We can just synchronize so that we pass through the portal ourselves. And that mum cat can't find their way back. They accidentally stumbled into some entrance somewhere that led to our land. And I was just coming back here to check on the kitten because the cat has asked for my help. And I said that I don't know what I could do to help, but I'd make sure their kitten's okay while we find out how to find the entrance that they passed through and find a way for them to come back. And Rosie discovers that she can communicate back with this fairy. She can understand the fairy and when she goes to speak, the fairy understands her back. And she asks what she could possibly do to help. And the fairy says that you could carry the kitten and you could use your sense of smell, see if there's a strange smell that you can't identify, that perhaps isn't of this world, and try and find the way through to the land of the fairies. And once you're through to that land, you can take the kitten to the mum. And then together, the three of you can find your way back out. And the mum can make sure that the kitten's okay. And so Rosie agrees to help. And starts to take some big sniffs of the air, moving her head around. And she pinpoints the faintest of smells that she knows she's not encountered here before. And she knows that it's not this kitten. And so she carefully picks up the kitten with her mouth. And the kitten relaxes and hangs there. And she follows that scent. And she's never encountered a cat before. And this is the first time she's encountered a kitten. And she weaves around the trees. Until eventually, she sees what looks like a disturbance on the ground. Like there was something here, but now it isn't. And she smells around, trying to identify what should be here and where that smell is coming from. And realises it's just a residual smell. But it's a smell of something that was here, not of something that is here. 
And the fairy asks, what is it? What have you discovered? And Rosie puts down the kitten gently and says that the smell that I was smelling came from here. But whatever it was isn't here now. But I think that this might be where the cat walked through into your land. And the fairy suddenly realises what had happened. That perhaps the pixies had created a portal that unlike the fairies when they travel, they manoeuvre just themselves through from one realm to another. Almost like just sliding from a realm to a realm. Whereas the pixies build up energy and then in a flash of light a portal opens. They appear almost like a bubble opening around them. And then as that bubble bursts the portal slowly closes again and the pixies are in the earthly realm. And then when they travel back, they concentrate. They create a ball of energy that surrounds them, that spreads out further and further from them. That then creates a rift across the realm. And as it bursts, they're back in their original realm. And as it slowly closes, so the portal between the two realms closes. And the fairy realises that the cat must have walked just at that moment through a pixie's portal from one realm to another. Because as the portal's fading, it doesn't look like anything. The light fades, and the portal remains just for a moment, but you would only notice the portals there if you entered it. And so, they now know what happened. But the difficulty was trying to find a pixie to open a portal. The fairy said she'll try and head back to her land and see if she can find a pixie to open a portal to this location. And that that'll explain why the cat couldn't find their way back because their way there didn't exist anymore. And in a twinkling flash of light, that fairy disappeared back as if into a tree, passing back into their own realm, back into the land of those fairies. And the dog just waited and waited while that little kitten squeaked and squeaked and tried to move around and seemed to be moving in such a way that the dog realised this little kitten was wanting to suckle, was wanting some food. And so Rosie knew that she had to get this kitten to its mum. And while sitting waiting, she could hear the rustling leaves overhead as the wind blew such a gentle breeze. And then all of a sudden, she had a strong smell that smelt like that residual trail that she just followed. But this smell was much stronger, so she picked up the kitten 
and headed in the direction of the smell. And she followed that smell as it got stronger and stronger and stronger. And she couldn't see anything, but the smell just continued to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then suddenly, the smell started getting weaker. And unknown to her, she had just walked through a pixie's portal. And she was now in the land of the fairies. And yet this land, at least here, among the trees, looked identical to where she had just come from. And so if it wasn't for the change in smell, she wouldn't have noticed that she was somewhere different. And then she saw that fairy come down, sparkling with light. And she could smell a stronger smell, a bit like the kitten. And that stronger smell seemed to be getting stronger and stronger. And the fairy said that they'd found a pixie that had opened the portal. But the dog couldn't see this pixie. And the fairy said that pixies are only visible to human children. That they're not visible to animals, they're not visible to adult humans. And then Rosie saw the cat dashing over. She put down the kitten, took a few steps back. And the cat ran over to the kitten, licked the kitten, and petted the kitten. And the kitten nuzzled its way in to have a drink of milk. And the cat laid down gently on its side, purring and licking the kitten while the kitten drunk the milk. And the fairy said that it might be best for the cat and the kitten to take a little while before they leave here and head back out of this realm. So for now, why not come back to where we live? And Rosie was curious with the smells here and excited at the thought of being able to explore these new smells. And now they knew how they were going to get back. But Rosie also knew that she couldn't be too long because her human friend would end up looking for her. So she had to be back before her human friend would start calling for her. And she followed the fairy. And the fairy led Rosie to some tall trees. And at the base of the tall trees were large mushroom houses. Some of the mushrooms were on mounds. Some of the mushrooms were sticking out of the trees some were just growing in the grass. And each one was a house that looked lived in. And some fairies came out of some of those houses. And some children fairies came out to see this dog. They've never seen a dog before. And the children fairies hadn't got their wings yet. So they ran over to the dog. They started petting at its legs, feeling the fur, grabbing chunks of the fur and rubbing their faces on it. Talking with excited, squeaky voices. And then some of the adult fairies ushered the children along 
so that Rosie could continue following and exploring. And Rosie was shown around the village, shown where the fairies live. And Rosie couldn't climb up into the trees, but looked up at the houses that were up in the trees and saw that these trees were full of different fairy houses with all these mushrooms of different kinds. And then, after a very short while, Rosie said that it was time for her to head back. And so the fairy went back with Rosie to the cat and the kitten. And the cat picked up the kitten. And Rosie and the cat looked at each other and then looked forward. And then in a flash, the fairy said, there's now a portal in front of you created by a pixie. So if you just walk through that portal, just walk forward, you'll find yourself back in your normal realm. And so they walked forward. And the cat and the kitten and Rosie headed back to where the kitten had been found. The cat tucked the kitten back down, came over to Rosie as if to thank Rosie, rubbing up almost on tiptoes against the side of Rosie and purring before heading back to the kitten. And Rosie could hear her human friend calling, so she ran out of the woodland, jumped the plants and ran across the grass and really wished that she could tell her human friend about her experience. But as she excitedly tried to tell her human friend, all the human saw was Rosie spinning around, jumping up and down and barking and wagging her tongue and shaking her tail. And the human laughed and said, you're very excitable, and leant down. Rosie came up, rested her head on the human's knee, while the human rubbed and stroked both sides of Rosie. before together they headed out of the park and headed back home. And once back home, Rosie spent some time in the garden enjoying the sun while her human carried on with other bits and pieces. And then as evening approached, A human friend settled down, reading a book, sitting on the sofa. Rosie climbed up on the sofa, rested her head onto the human's lap. The human put an arm around Rosie, and with one hand was just gently stroking Rosie as Rosie began to drift and flow to sleep, while the human read that book. And Rosie drifted into the most pleasant dreams about her experiences from the day, curious whether she would ever meet that cat and kitten again, or whether she would ever meet a fairy again, and what pixies look like. She hoped that one day maybe she would encounter a child and be able to figure out from that child what a pixie looks like. And resting there, being stroked so softly and gently, 
she drifted and floated so peacefully and so comfortably, relaxed asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably relax, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this bedtime story in the background. And you find yourself climbing a mountain. And as you climb this mountain, you can notice the wind around you. You can hear each footstep you take. And notice what each footstep sounds like on that path. Digging in the soles of your feet and the ball of your toes as you push yourself up that mountain. With the wind rushing around the mountain face. Clouds seeming to streak by high in the sky. And you climb higher up that mountain well above the tree line below. And once high up in the mountain, you turn around to rest. You sit yourself down on a rock and you look out over the route that you've taken. You look at the path up the mountain from that forest below. And you can see way off in the distance the sun beginning to set over the forest and over a lake in the forest. With the way that from up here you can notice the golden light dancing and twinkling on the surface of the lake. Almost like the lake is full of sparkling diamonds almost silently twinkling over there in the distance. And as that sun sets lower and lower, eventually it seems to almost touch the horizon and seems to almost have like a second sun climb up to meet it just as it's reaching the horizon. And although that sun appeared like it was moving so slowly and almost imperceptibly across the sky, now that it's down near the horizon, it suddenly looks so much larger. And you can notice its movement. You can see as it turns a deep red. The shadowy outline of the forest trees across the lower half of its face. And the slight shimmering and movement to those trees. As the sun continues to silently set over there. And while the sun is setting behind the horizon, you set up a tent up here on this mountainside. You find the ideal space for the tent, protected slightly from the elements. You set up that tent. You start a little campfire in front of the tent. You sit just inside the entrance to the tent making yourself some food and drink while you rest and relax deeper into the experience. And the sun has now gone over the horizon and yet there's still 
sunlight illuminating the sky, creating the most beautiful red glow. And you know that down at the bottom of the mountain, it's probably already a darker blue. And the sun will have set a few minutes ago. And while that red glow gradually fades to blue, you can see an ever-increasing array of stars arched overhead, twinkling, dancing. And then while the darkness increases and you gaze up at the sky, you can notice colours just faintly in the sky. But the longer your eyes begin to adapt to the light and you keep them looking in a direction away from the campfire, you notice the moving light almost dancing in the sky of greens, a little bit of yellow, some blue, some red. Almost like someone's shaking out some sheets. And you start thinking to yourself about mythology. How certain stories, perhaps, would be told around a campfire. And how sights like this could be turned into myths as a way of trying to explain what it is and what's going on. And you imagine to yourself that perhaps someone could be sat looking at a similar scene. Maybe a child or someone else asks what the lights in the sky are. And maybe the person responds by thinking that it's perhaps a god shaking out the sheets from the day. Shaking off the dust. And that the dust is perhaps the stars and the twinkling is that dust becoming static in the sky as you just see a glimpse of the God's world. And all you can see is the faint colours of the God's garments being shaken out and hung out to dry for the night. Their day clothes, their party clothes, their bright coloured clothes with that dust appearing in the night sky, hanging in the sky until morning, where time for those gods moves so slowly that the dust just slowly ebbs across the night sky, falling down to earth as the night goes on. And that all night long they shake out those clothes, constantly shaking out more dust that settles through the night. And perhaps they share about how these gods have extended lives, that you can tell that by how slow that dust travels and falls from the sky, arching down towards the earth as the night goes on, before disappearing by morning. And that when you shake out a blanket, the dust spreads around in the sky in the same way, but much quicker it settles down towards the ground. And so the whole night of your time must be just a few moments of the God's time.
and you think to yourself about what it would be like to be told stories like that and have no other context, no other explanation, no other understanding. And so, buying into the stories, initially not necessarily believing them, but when someone comes to you and asks you to explain the same thing, you share the same story you were told, and then the next person shares the same story, and over time perhaps some of those stories become more elaborate. Perhaps someone asks why they're cleaning their clothes at night and shaking them out at night. And perhaps someone then responds, adding more context, like perhaps they went to a party in their bright clothes, a gathering of the gods. And then someone asks about the party, who held the party? And so you now have some names of the gods, of who held what party, who attended and whose garments these must be. And then, within a few generations, you have these stories carrying on as the only logical explanation, and just following on to believe what's being told, because you believe that gods must exist, because you see evidence of them everywhere around you in the life that you see, in the beauty of nature, in every sunset and sunrise. You see that every time the sun rises, it must be because the gods blessed you again and blessed humanity, giving them another day. And as the sun sets, it must be the struggle, the fight, that takes place, where the darkness wants to rule and reign. And perhaps in some parts of the world, you imagine, where there are times of the year with long nights and short days, other times of the year with long days and short nights. Maybe the gods are battling it out and the helpful gods are winning at some times and struggling more at others and that part of that time of struggling has the planet suffering because of the struggling, where crops struggle, where it gets freezing cold. But then when it's incredibly hot and the gods are winning, maybe they need to be asked to just tone things back a bit, that they're giving too much light and so, while you begin to comfortably drift asleep in that tent, you have all these thoughts about mythology, about how people develop their beliefs over time, how stories and myths begin, how events can become myths and legends, where there was a grain of truth at the start, but then to make it easier to remember the story you're telling. People begin to make alterations, they begin to neaten the story up, they begin to add elements that make the story more memorable like the use of threes and sevens. 
they begin to give it a clearer structure, a beginning, a middle and an end. They begin to add in good and bad. And they make various changes to make it easier and more compelling to tell. And they don't do this out of any way to deceive. Just realising that if they make a few changes to how they're telling it that time, it's easier to remember and the moral of the story, the message is being conveyed. Are conveyed in a more potent and powerful way that grabs the listener, has more of a hook, is able to be grasped by the younger generation. It makes the stories less boring and more engaging. And while you think about these things, you drift and float so peacefully and so comfortably asleep. And the next day, you awaken. You open your tent, take a deep, comfortable breath of the fresh, cool mountain air. And feeling so refreshed and comfortable when you wake up. You have yourself some food before packing everything away while the sun's still rising. You continue your journey to the top of the mountain and then begin to descend down the other side. And as you descend down the other side, so you find it a little more treacherous underfoot and yet so much quicker to descend than it was to ascend. You just have to pay more attention to what you're doing. And you manage to make it all the way down the mountain without slipping or sliding. And at the base of the mountain, you head over to the edge of a river. You begin to follow the river. Initially through the meadows this side of the mountain. Aware of how lush these meadows look. The wild flowers. The bees. Just so gently flying from plant to plant. The butterflies almost haphazardly leaping from one plant to another and occasionally spiralling around each other before separating off from each other and continuing their journey. And the running, flowing sound of the river alongside you. And you think about the contrast this side with the meadow to the other side of the mountain with the forest and how dense and dark the forest is compared to this open, bright meadow. And you can see off in the distance some deer just enjoying the grass in the meadow. And then you hear this sound and you see a small cat meowing and running over to you and it begins to weave itself between your legs rubbing its head the side of its neck against the side of your leg lifting one leg off the ground while it does that as it pushes itself against your leg and you crouch down for a moment and you pet that cat you stroke its back and then it seems to become a dead weight and flops on its side. Now you stroke its side, just under its front leg. Then it rolls onto its back and you stroke its belly. And then it playfully grabs at your hand a little bit. 
You can hear that cat purring while it plays. And then you stand up and continue your journey and the cat follows you as you walk along the edge of the water. And you continue along the side of the water through this meadow. And from time to time you put your hand into your pocket and you touch the pocket watch that's in your pocket and feel a sense of deep sentimentality and continue to walk. And about halfway through the day, the cat stops and starts meowing. And you turn around and you look at that cat and you can see it just sat there looking at you, meowing. And so you stop as well. You set up a camp. You light a fire. And you get a fishing rod. And you just sit there for a little while, waiting for some fish. And then after you've successfully caught a few fish, you cook up some food for yourself and for the cat. An evening is beginning to set in now. And you know that it isn't far to where you're heading. Just a few more hours walk. So just after it starts to get dark, you should arrive at your destination. So you pack everything up. You continue to walk along the edge of the river. Listening to that most beautiful sound of the calm, relaxing river water bubbling along. Hearing the sounds of nature around you and that cat walking along with you. Sounds of birds, sounds of each footstep that you take. As you walk along the edge of that river and you can see in the distance lights of a small village you follow the river round towards the village. And as you approach the village, so night time has set in. You have to cross a bridge to the other side of the river. You walk along the road into the village. Walk through the village past a couple of taverns. A few places to stay, a few different places to eat. You find your way to a clockmaker, the only clockmaker in this land that knows how to fix your pocket watch. You take your pocket watch into that clockmaker's, opening the door, hearing the bell ding as the door opens and ding again as the door closes. The cat at this point climbs up to avoid the closing door onto your shoulder and is perched across your shoulders. And you walk through the clockmaker's shop the sounds of ticking clocks all around you. Noticing as you look around, clocks on the walls, their pendulums swinging and ticking. Many of them ticking out of sync with each other. Making a cacophony of ticks and tocks. and the echoing sound of each step on the wooden floor. As you walk over to the counter, you ding a bell on the counter and then wait. 
And the cat climbs down your arm and onto the counter and lies down on the counter. And then you hear a voice saying, hello, can I help you? And the voice is coming from right in front of you. And you say that you would like to have your pocket watch fixed. You'd like it repaired. And you get that pocket watch out of your pocket, place it on the counter. And you see that watch lift up off the counter, pop open, turn over, looking at the back side, turn back to the front side. The chain just hanging down, shaking a little and dancing a little as the pocket watch is moved in front of your eyes. And then the voice says, I should be able to have this fixed by morning. You can check in to the nearby hotel and return in the morning and it'll all be done. And you thank the voice. And the cat climbs back up onto your shoulder. And you leave the clockmaker's shop. You head to a nearby hotel. You grab yourself something to eat. Book a room for the night. And the cat joins you for the food and for the room. You settle down in the room. And drift and float so peacefully and so comfortably asleep. And while you sleep, the clockmaker gets to work. And back in the clockmaker's shop, the invisible clockmaker puts on some gloves, puts on some glasses, and the glasses appear to almost have multiple glasses like glasses in front of glasses in front of glasses, getting smaller and smaller. And the invisible clockmaker then gets incredibly small tools out and starts to work on that clock. They carefully pop the back off of the clock. And they begin to clean it up, carefully removing dirt and grime, before they even start work on fixing this pocket watch. And after they've cleaned it up, they start looking at what is wrong with the watch. And they go over by their fire. And under the light of the fire, they take a closer look at the watch. And they realize that the stones in the watch, the stones that imbue the watch with its magical properties, as all watches in the land have, that one of those stones has fallen out and that that's what the problem is. And all pocket watches in the land and all clocks in the land are imbued with a specific magical element so that they don't just keep time but they keep purpose and some can help to read emotion. Some can help to speed up and slow down time. Some can even stop time to everyone who's not holding the watch. Some 
Some can make the wearer more attractive to others. And there are various other powers these watches have, depending on the stones that are placed in them and how they were made. This one was missing a stone that, when it contained all the correct parts, would make this watch able to stop time for the person holding the watch. And so the invisible clockmaker went over to a large wooden bucket of water. They took some powder. They sprinkled that powder into the water, which fizzed and popped and bubbled as it dissolved in that water. And then that water became incredibly still, the surface of which was almost mirror-like. And the clockmaker carefully, just very gingerly, moved around that water, trying not to disturb the stillness. They then reached down towards that water with a tiny little pair of tweezers and stretching down and leaning over and looking very closely at where they were reaching with the tweezers. They carefully picked up this incredibly small almost diamond-looking floating gem from the surface of the water that was so small and they had to be so careful with it. And it was actually so small that it wasn't breaking the surface tension of the water. It was just sitting there on the surface. And as they got closer and closer, they could see the slight bend in the light the slight indentation in the surface of the water as it carried that crystal. And they had to carefully pluck that crystal off the surface of the water without puncturing the surface, without making it so that the crystal falls through and is lost in the pool of water in this bucket. And so very carefully... And very slowly, they picked that crystal up from the surface of the water, making sure their tweezers didn't touch the water itself. They then had to carefully get that back to their workbench, without dropping it because it was so small and delicate, it could either break or get lost. Back at their workbench. They placed it down in a tiny little metal container while they prepared the watch to place that crystal in the watch. They then picked it up and very carefully aligned it with where and how it needed to go into the watch. They placed it into the watch, sealed the watch back up again, polished the outside of the watch, made it all look just right for collection the next day. And the next day you wake up, you feel like you've had the most incredible night's sleep. You have some breakfast before heading back to that clockmaker's And you arrive back at the clockmakers, enter their shop, and you can see your pocket watch hanging on the wall, looking almost like new. 
and you hear a voice telling you that it's all done now. And then they get that watch down for you and put it on the counter for you to see closely. And they tell you what was wrong with it, what had stopped it working. And you take a look at the front, the back. You pop that watch open and look at the face of the watch. You can hear it. Ticking along, you can hear the mechanism moving inside the watch. You press the button on the side of the watch and everything goes silent. Time stands still. And then you press the button again. The ticking comes back. And you can hear the sounds outside and the sounds around you again. And you're always amazed when you stop time, how silent things really are when there's no propagation of sound waves. That even when people are in places that they think are silent, they're really not as silent as they imagine. And that it's only when you stop time that you can truly appreciate the moment where everything stops. And you know that you need to pay the clockmaker. And so you pay the clockmaker. You head out of the shop, and this cat seems to want to hang around with you. And so they start heading back with you on your journey, back the way you came. You know you've got a long trek ahead of you. You head back, through the meadows, up and over the mountains, this time with a cat joining you on the journey, resting on your shoulders, sometimes climbing into a bag. You head through the forest, all the way to that lake. You head beyond the lake, following a long road. You head to a small little monastery. Head into that monastery. You settle down for the night and drift so peacefully and comfortably asleep. And then the next day, you go out into the gardens of the monastery. And like every day here, where you live in this monastery, you sit on your rock. The rock that you meditate on. And the cat relaxes onto your lap. And using your pocket watch, you press the button. You freeze time, and with time frozen, you watch that nature around you. You see birds mid-flight. You see a waterfall stretching down towards a pool and not quite touching it. You see a fish mid-leap out of the pool. And you begin to just take a moment 
of learning about the moment, about being in the moment, by pausing and extending that moment. And you stretch out your awareness within the moment to the forest, to the lake, to the distant mountains. And everything is silent. You just stretch out your awareness to connect consciousness between yourself in the moment and everything around you. You can see the fairy's village in your mind's eye. And fairies just hovering in the air. You can see under the ground the trolls living in their land. And you can see the distant land of the giants. Your consciousness can connect with the beasts of the sea and every day you come out here and sit on this rock. You pause time for what to you is just eight or ten hours. And yet to everyone else, when you restart time, no time has passed. And in that time, you practice connecting with the world around you. And all the other monks in this monastery do their own different practices. Some use watches to travel back in time and observe the past. Others travel forward in time and observe the future. And they all work together to explore different aspects of reality different aspects of consciousness, of existence. And frequently they then share their knowledge, each becoming an expert in their one area, and then sharing their knowledge to be able to help each other to increase their overall knowledge and skills. And then at the end of the day, you head to bed. The cat curls up on the bed at the foot of the bed. You settle down and you drift and float so peacefully and comfortably asleep, drifting, floating, deeply asleep all night long, knowing that you'll awaken feeling incredible in the morning, feeling full of energy and positive looking forward to what you'll be doing tomorrow. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift to sleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And this is a sleep story about a monk sitting in a monastery. And in front of them is a quantum singing bowl. And they hold 
a soft hammer in their hand. And they rest that across the palm of their other hand. And they sit in a meditative pose and allow themselves to begin to drift comfortably into the moment drifting and floating deeper and deeper into a meditative state. And as they drift deeper and deeper into meditation, they find themselves connecting with the world around them. They notice how their breathing seems to almost become one with the air around them. With each breath of breeze, they breathe in a breath of that air. And then they breathe out the air joining the breeze as it passes. And they can hear birds in the distance. Hear the gentle mumble of distant people. And after a little while, they stop noticing their own body, as if their body has become one with the world around them. And they then gaze at that bowl, and with that hammer, they gently strike the bowl just a single time before removing the hammer, resting it back down on their lap, continuing to gaze at that bowl. And as they gaze at that bowl, so they can hear the ringing of that singing bowl the note the bowl is creating, and they can see what looks almost like pulses in the air, rising and dancing from that bowl. And they watch as those pulses rise and dance from their bowl, as this quantum singing bowl creates a connection through the quantum realm connecting all versions of reality in this moment. And with every passing moment, new versions of reality are constantly being created. And the connection continues through all of these new realities. And each new reality feeds back in to that singing bowl's note, stabilizing the note. And as that note stabilizes, so this quantum realm stabilizes. And that pulsing coming up from the bowl pulses at a steady rate, almost like smoke rising up from a fire. It rises steady before reaching a height where the chaos within the smoke dissipates it to almost nothingness. It becomes so spread and the same with the note. That pulsing rises, and at some point in the air, the slight chaos in the pulse spreads out, making the pulsing appear to disappear. And the monk just continues to stare at that bowl. And then once the quantum realms are stable, The monk uses their mind 
to have a sense of being in the different realms, of being sat in exactly the same location, just seeing the location from within themselves who are sat in one of the other realms. And as they rest there, the neurology synchronizes across the realms in almost a brief moment of fuzziness or haze. Reality around them seems to lose focus for a fraction of a second so quickly that it's quick enough to almost question whether you really saw what you just saw. As they find themselves in a new reality, still sitting in the same location. But now they are in the them who is in this reality. And they have the knowledge of the them who is in this reality. Because this is who they now are in this moment. And because they are traveling through the quantum realm. And they're aware of what they're doing. As they then continue to think and focus on traveling to a different reality. They maintain their awareness of what they learned from this reality. And with a brief haze or flash, a new reality forms around them, and each reality largely looks the same, with almost imperceptible changes. But there are other, wider changes in the reality. That the them in the reality is aware of. And as their neurology synchronizes with the neurology of the them in that reality. They learn and gain the knowledge of the reality. While sharing the knowledge of their reality with this them in this reality. And that singing bowl just continues. And they traverse multiple realities, gaining broader knowledge of the universal reality, of almost what it would be like to step back out of reality, up above reality, where you could see all these realities stretched out below. And they learn about realities where there are favorable events and realities where there are more unfavorable events. And they just take it as knowledge the variety of experience that people can have, that every reality is created through random processes, and they're just experiencing slithers of the different outcomes of those random processes, where every decision that could be made was made somewhere at some point, each leading to a separate reality. But all these quantum realms overlay each other and exist simultaneously. It's just that normally people are fixed in their one reality, their one perception of reality, unaware that 
when they make a decision to walk out of a door. They create a different reality to when they arrive at their door and then decide, actually, I'm going to take something out with me. And they turn around and they walk back and they pick something up and they walk back to their door and then they leave their door. Compared to a reality where someone goes to leave their door and decides to just check to see if their shoelaces are tied or not. And so they then leave the door just moments later than they would have done. And each of these minor changes leads to very different future outcomes. And each of those different realities is happening simultaneously at exactly the same point in space-time, just at a different frequency of reality. That the matter is there for all the realities, an infinite matter, infinite density throughout the universe. And that infinity is constantly creating larger infinities. But the monk doesn't give any of that too much thought. They're more about the experiential. They're more about exploring the experience. Rather than understanding the science. And it's very rare for people to reach this advanced stage of meditation where they can use the quantum singing bowls to traverse through the quantum realm from one reality to another. And with all the changes that can occur and have occurred in the past, each reality contains slightly different knowledge. Because some small changes, like someone leaving home a fraction of a second later, might end up being stopped waiting to cross a road where previously they could cross easily. And so now that fraction of a second delay leaving home, perhaps becomes 10 or 20 seconds on their journey. And the original version of them has already walked further down the road while they're still waiting to cross. And then after they cross the road, they continue on their journey. And perhaps the other version of them reaches a specific location where they see something that sparks an idea that they go on to then develop that then happens to transform the world like suddenly developing a communication system or a specific way of doing things, or some invention, perhaps, around powering devices, or any number of other things. And yet, in the reality where the person left home a fraction of a second later, and got delayed crossing a road, they don't see that thing that makes them come up with that idea, that makes them have that aha moment. And so in that reality, that transformative knowledge may not arise at that point in time. In the same way that there could be a reality 
where Alexander Fleming doesn't discover penicillin. Well, there could be a reality where Einstein doesn't make his insights because he's busy doing something else or because his life and focus takes a different path. And yet there could be realities where even greater discoveries have been had and even more profound changes have occurred within those realities. And so this monk traverses through the quantum realm to themselves in each different realm and explores the different realms. And then after that period of exploring the realms and almost having a lightheadedness from the amount of knowledge suddenly thrust into their mind, They lean forward with one hand. They gently touch the side of the singing bowl. And feel the vibrations from it. And those vibrations slowing down as their fingertips touch the bowl. To the point where the bowl goes quiet. Where the experience comes to an end. And they can place the hand back in place on their lap. And drift deeper and deeper into the experience. Now drifting to a place where they consolidate all of that learning. And they know that in each of the relevant quantum realms. The other them will be doing the same. They'll be consolidating these learnings. And as they drift and consolidate the learnings, their brain tries to make sense of the experience and finds its usual creative ways of consolidating the learning, consolidating that learning through metaphor. And they start to drift into a dream. And they dream about being a wise one. Walking along the top of a cliff. Overlooking the most beautiful ocean. And they walk down from that cliff. Sounds of the waves. Crashing against the cliff. Getting louder and louder as they descend. Down a path down the side of the cliff, down to the water's edge, as large waves are just rolling in and crashing around them. And they can smell the salty air, they can hear those waves rumbling, drawing out stones as they pull back out to sea. The rolling and crashing of those waves back onto the shore. The churning sound as they roll up the shore. The sound of them striking the cliffs. And the spray in the air. And as they gaze out over the water. They see a curious sight. They see a goose honking while riding on the back of a turtle. Almost surfing those waves on the back of that turtle. With the turtle steering and controlling its movements among the waves. 
the goose keeping balance with its wings, almost honking with enjoyment. And as the waves that the goose is surfing on that turtle on reach the shore, the turtle turns sharply to the side to head across the wave before pulling back out to sea again. And as the turtle pulls back out to sea, so the goose catches some air, launches off that turtle's back, just as it's turning, almost as if that goose has been catapulted up into the air. And as that goose swoops around and swings around in the air, rising in the air, it seems to morph into a dragon, flicking its tail, flapping its wings, stretching its neck, almost glowing and launching higher into the sky, circling and circling, almost like it's circling in an updraft rising, growing into a larger dragon, flying and circling high overhead. And this wise one watches as the waves continue to roll in and crash on the shore. And with one wave, they notice a little glint of light coming from the centre of the wave as it rises out of the water before it crashes down. They hear the clink, clank and rolling of a glass bottle being thrown across the shore. They head over to that glass bottle and discover that inside this sealed glass bottle is a scrap of paper. They pop the cork out of the top of the bottle. They tip out the paper. They unroll that paper. And they read the message. And the message just says, travel south to find the tree that sparkles and shines in the sun, that catches the beams, making one become many. And they're curious what this means. And so they climb back up the cliff again. They gaze south over the ocean. And they can see off in the distance what appears to be a small island. They head back down to the shore. They make themselves a raft with some driftwood. They paddle out, pulling that raft with them, swimming out through the waves that are crashing on the shore. Once they clear the curling waves, they climb onto the raft, bobbing up and down on those waves, and with their hands they paddle towards that island. And the further from the shore they get, the softer the waves get, the more gentle those waves get, the calmer and slower the waves seem to pass by. And as they near the island, they allow the waves that are approaching the island 
to take them in to the shore, almost riding those waves to the shore. With the raft sliding up the beach on this island, as the waves spread up that shore, and we look around on the island, and they find on the island what looks like a cave, they head into that cave, and it's dark in the cave, but after a little while, it's as if their eyes are starting to get used to some light that's down here, just the faintest light, and they start to see subtle detail. And they follow the slight breeze through the cave. Feeling the coolness and the comfortableness of the air in this cave. Heading deeper and deeper into the cave. And as they head deeper into the cave. So they notice that it seems to be getting lighter and lighter. And then somewhere deep in this cave, they turn a corner and discover a large cavern. And this large cavern looks almost like it's daylight and it's outside. There's grass all over the base of the cave on the ground. And there's the most beautiful tree standing tall in the middle of the cave. And hanging from the tree are crystal leaves. And they walk towards that tree and they can hear what almost sounds like slight twinkling and humming as the most beautiful notes from the tree as if the leaves rubbing together and making that tree sing an ethereal tune. And the tree has a reasonably narrow trunk with the softest and smoothest bark. And they run their hands around that soft, smooth bark of the tree. And they don't know what is expected of them here. So they just sit and wait and admire the view of this tree and how this place looks so much like it could be outside. And the ceiling of this cave here in this cavern almost appears to glow with a daylight blue. And then as they wait and wait, suddenly they notice a shard of light appear from the ceiling. And they can see that that shard of light, which is reaching the ground, seems to be very, very slowly moving across the ground in the direction of the tree. And they realise that somewhere up high in this cavern is a single hole out to the outside world, and that the sun passing across the sky has reached a point where the sunlight is shining down through that hole, almost focused by the hole, to create a line of light, a shard of light that's moving towards that tree. And the wise one stands up and watches 
as that light gets closer and closer, incredibly slowly moving closer and closer to the tree. And as it reaches the tree, so the first leaves that it reaches start reflecting and splitting that light, making rainbow colours spread off from those leaves. And they start chiming even more, as if the light has some pressure to it. And a little bit later, that light eventually reaches near the middle of the tree. And as it does, the most incredible thing happens. That the way the leaves are laid out makes that light reflect around from the middle of the tree out to all the leaves bouncing around between the leaves. But for projecting around the inside of the cavern off in all directions, down, left, right, in front, behind, and all around upwards as well, just reflecting that light, the most beautiful rainbow patterns. And the wise ones unsure what this all means, what they should learn from this. And that light, is reflecting across them as well as they stand in this cavern. And for a while, as the sun slowly moves across the sky, the light slowly moves around the inside of the cavern. And they watch this experience, aware that this probably only happens at most once every day. And with the increased reflecting light, so the whole tree begins to sing and chime in the most beautiful way. And as it does, they hear a rumbling on the far wall and they notice a cave entrance open up on that far wall, as if the mechanism for triggering that entrance opening was a specific frequency of the chiming from the tree. And they don't know how long they'll have before the entrance closes, or if the entrance will close, but they assume that given this happens almost every day, that the entrance probably opens every day to that chime and then closes as the chime dies down, ready to open again the next day. So they quickly head in to this opened cave and inside the cave they see a pedestal right in the middle of the cave and on that pedestal is a book. And it's an old, incredibly ornate, beautiful book. They carefully open that book and take a look at the pages. And every single page is a mirror. And they look at each page carefully before closing the book, placing it back on the pedestal, aware that they've learned what they came here to learn, what knowledge this had to share. They could hear the cave entrance beginning to close, so they dashed out back into the room with the tree, they watched as the sunlight finished passing across that tree, before then heading back out of the cavern, back through the cave, back from the island towards the mainland, on their raft. Then heading back up onto the cliff, 
gazing out over the ocean towards that island. Aware that this is an inner experience, like a dream guided by their unconscious mind to educate them on the experience that they had had during meditation. And so they just gazed out over the view as the sea began to calm and the sun began to set and they watched as that sun set in the distance and the stars appeared in the sky and the Milky Way arched across the sky and then as nightfall deepened here and darkened here so they drifted almost into a place of nothingness in their mind, a place where there was no backwards, no forwards, no left, no right, no up, nor down. A place where there was just being in the moment, where time may as well have stood still, with no reference in this place to be able to judge time. And then when their mind was ready, they drifted back to being by that singing bowl where they finished up their meditation. And that night, still absorbing their experience and processing all the knowledge they had gained and the inner experience they had had they drifted and floated so peacefully and so pleasantly asleep, aware that they'll sleep so comfortably all night and awaken feeling refreshed and revitalized in the morning. As they peacefully drifted and floated, relaxed asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you comfortably drift asleep, you can have a sense of a woman called Meg, and Meg lives in the coziest log cabin on a farm, and every evening she settles down, reading a good book, aware of the flickering, dancing light from a log fire. And she absorbs herself in that book before heading to bed. And every day she heads out onto the farm with her sheepdog, Milton. And together they round up the sheep. They rotate them from one field to the next, across the year. Meg enjoys the change of the seasons. She enjoys the way the sun rises on crisp winter mornings with that low, 
lying mist, the glistening dew on the grass, the warmth of the sun in the summer, the changes of the flowers and plant life as the seasons change from browns and very little colour to an explosion of greens and colourful plants through spring and an increase in life. with butterflies and bees and birds flying overhead and the birth of lambs and seeing all those little lambs in the field and then as summer approaches a peak of dense plants and leaves and greenery where the woodland is at its most dense and then approaching autumn where that woodland changes colours where it goes from shades of green to shades of browns and bronze and yellows and then back to the winter and every day of every year Meg enjoys the comfortable repetition of this lifestyle working on the farm through the day settling down with a good book in the evening in the log cabin watching the changing seasons as each year progresses and then one day while Meg is out in the fields with Milton moving the sheep from one field to the next enjoying the peace and the comfort of the experience of just encouraging Milton to herd those sheep and watching as Milton does such an incredible job of that Meg notices somebody sat on the fence of one of the fields. And so after the sheep are herded into the relevant field, she heads over to that person. And it's a person wearing a fitted full length purple jacket and as they jump down off of the fence the jacket flows around them before closing around them as they land and this person in purple approaches them And Meg asks who they are. And they explain that they're a wizard. That they're the wizard of this environment. And that they need her help. That they're always watching how the different farmers 
and the different people in all the villages interact with the environment. That they come from the nearby forest. And now they need Meg's help. And Meg expresses that she doesn't know how she could be able to help. All she's ever known is this farming life. And the wizard explained that there's a desert coming. That if they're not careful, all this land that's lush and green in the summer and the spring will turn to just being desert, that it'll all turn to dust, and that they need Meg's help to put a stop to this, that a portal between a desert world and this world had been opened up accidentally by someone who was experimenting with something they didn't really know. But the only way to seal the portal and save this world from becoming a desert planet is to head through that portal into the desert world to find the temple in the desert. And to activate the switch that will seal the portal. And once the switch is activated, it sets in motion a process that leads to the closure of the portal. And that there'll be time to activate that switch and make it back across the desert to the portal and leave through the portal before it closes. And they'll be able to know whether they were successful because the portal will end up closing behind them. And Meg asks why the wizard can't just do this themselves. And why they're being chosen. And the wizard explains that the portal has opened up in the nearby woodland and is beginning to influence the nearby woodland and that that woodland is the epicenter of where the desert will begin spreading from on this world and that the trigger that opens the portal makes a tremendous amount of noise that's such a great amount of noise that the wizard themselves can't access that desert world and get anywhere near to the trigger. But because Meg can't hear and so experiences the world differently. She can head to that temple and trigger the switch, triggering the closure of the portal without being affected by the incredibly loud noise. And the wizard explains that they can guide Meg to the portal and they can wait at the edge of the portal but they can't pass through that portal because the noise is so loud 
and it gets louder and louder the closer to the switch. And it's so loud that it's painful just to pass through the portal. And Meg agrees to help this wizard. And so the wizard walks with Meg down towards the woodland. And they walk into the woodland, Meg noticing the changes to the air temperature. Almost like a change to the pressure on her skin. And the dancing light as some of the sun's rays break through the canopy of the woodland. And the feeling of each footstep on the path as she walks along following that wizard. And after some time walking deeper and deeper into the woodland. They come to a clearing. Where the desert has begun. Changing the ground. And in the centre of this desert like clearing. Is almost like an orb in space. Just sitting there above the ground. And through that orb. Meg could see that other world. And she walked around the orb. And she could see that other world in different directions. As if she was walking around in that other world. Yet she was just looking through that sphere. That orb. And as she walked around. From one direction she could see way off on the horizon a slight spike on the horizon which is otherwise relatively flat and is aware that that's the top of the pyramid that she's got to head towards. And she walks up to the orb. And the wizard walks with her. And the wizard puts the hand on her shoulder. Looks her square in the eye. And says good luck. Meg smiles. Milton sits down next to the wizard. And Meg tentatively and with a little apprehension steps into that orb. And as soon as she steps through that orb so she can feel the increased temperature of this desert world. She walks a few steps, turns and looks back, and can see an orb floating in space, and through that orb she can see the wizard and Milton. She can see the trees of the woodland. She turns back towards the pyramid. 
and she's surprised how still the air seems here. And she walks through the sand in the direction of the pyramid. Finding her feet sinking into that sand slightly with each step that she takes. Almost like walking on an incredibly dry, sandy beach. And she continues walking towards that pyramid. And as she walks towards that pyramid, so she looks around her. And she sees that the sun in the sky here appears so much larger than the sun on her own planet. And as she walks towards that pyramid, getting closer and closer, as that pyramid gets larger and larger on the horizon, so that sun slowly begins to set. And as the sun sets, so she notices, just as she would expect on Earth, the temperature begins to drop. And she wants to reach that pyramid before nightfall. Because she knows she won't be able to see it as soon as the sun has fully set. As she picks up her pace, continues to walk towards that pyramid, and can just see the dark shape of the pyramid against the reddening night sky. And a short time after the sun has fully dropped over the horizon, she manages to arrive at that pyramid. And she knows that she doesn't want to turn off the portal until she can see her way back across the desert. She's aware that the air still seems incredibly still. She walks into the entrance to the pyramid and decides to just rest in the entrance of the pyramid until the sun begins to rise again. And she felt that the speed the sun set would mean that it would rise in perhaps six to eight hours. And so she decided that she would settle down and relax for a little while. And she could see as the sky got darker and darker. Stars in the sky here. Not recognising any of the constellations. Noticing some patches in the sky as her eyes. Adapted to the dark. Noticing some reds and greens. Almost like there were some clouds in the sky. In space. She saw that there seemed to be far more shooting stars here than she'd ever seen on Earth. When gazing up at the night sky. And she found this environment to be so peaceful with the air being so still, the desert being so still. This temple, this pyramid being so still. And just the gentle movement of the stars across the sky, almost imperceptible. And those shooting stars. She imagined that this planet 
must orbit a star in a more dense cloud of gas and dust than the earth that perhaps leads to a higher rate of shooting stars. And she thought about how still and calm and peaceful everything is here. I was curious about whether there really was this incredibly loud noise coming from within this temple. As she was unaware of any noise at all. And while she relaxed there, she found herself beginning to drift gently and comfortably asleep. And as she drifted asleep, she began to dream. She dreamt about walking with Milton high up in some mountains, enjoying walking around those mountains and finding a river up in those mountains and getting into a canoe with Milton and carefully pushing through the water in that canoe and feeling each push, each stroke through that water. Feeling the coolness of the mountain air on her cheeks. And seeing how happy Milton looks sat opposite her. And placing the oar in the canoe. And putting her hand into the water, feeling the coolness of that water. Noticing that coolness, the way it can spread from the fingertips to the palm of the hand. And gently up the arm. It made her aware of the power of the environment where such a small act as touching the water could lead to a physical change like the hand going numb. And she thought to herself, about that numbness as she lifted her hand out of the water and whether it would be possible to transfer that numbness elsewhere. And as the canoe just gently and slowly drifted on the water, she touched her nose with her hand and she could already feel the coolness of the air on her nose and passing in and out of her nostrils with each breath. But she was curious whether it was possible to touch your nose and pass that numbness into the nostrils and into the nose and deep down into the sinuses and as she touched her nose, so she could feel her nose becoming numb, that numbness spreading inside the nose and through the sinus system. Then after a few moments, she began the process of habituating to this change. She was still aware of being able to breathe in and out so comfortably. 
you're still aware of the feeling of that breathed in and out air as it passed into the lungs and out of the lungs. And she was aware that the more numb her nose and sinuses became, the easier it became for her to breathe so comfortably as her nose seemed to almost stop, almost inflaming itself to the cold and just relaxed and breathed normally and comfortably. And she started developing these insights. She was already aware that the fact that she can't hear means that it doesn't matter how much noise is around her, her ears aren't affected or irritated by that noise. And she was now realizing that as she made her nose numb, the frigid air no longer affected or irritated her nostrils, and she could breathe calmly and deeply, with each breath being a pleasure. She imagined that with a numb nose, if any of Milton's fur got into her nose, it wouldn't tickle. She would just continue to be able to breathe fine. And as she continued with Milton to let that canoe drift across this river, so she gained some deeper relaxation and insight. She could feel the warmth of the sun and the coolness of the air somehow mixing and mingling to trigger healing deep within her here, as if just drifting and floating in nature in this peaceful way had deep healing properties and that dreaming this allows you to heal yourself and create that healing change deeply. And after, without any thought, she did some deep inner healing. She started to feel that the sun was rising, that there was a warmth on her cheeks that wasn't from the inner experience, and that there was a light on her eyes that wasn't from the inner experience. And she drifted back, and noticing that the sun was rising on this desert planet, and as the sun rose, she could see that her footsteps were still in the sand. The air was incredibly still. She headed into the pyramid. And she could feel pulsing. Like a deep vibrating passing up from the ground through her feet. She could feel that that pulsing was increasing. And so she followed that increasing pulsing as she navigated around this temple, navigated around the inside of this pyramid. Until eventually, she saw something which almost seemed to be sending lightning bolts up through the roof of the pyramid. 
and a switch. And she walked over to that switch. She felt a little tension as she reached for the switch, unsure exactly what was going to happen next. She pressed that switch. and could feel a change through her feet to that deep pulsing. And she could see that things around the walls were beginning to change. The pillars were starting to turn. She didn't know who turned this on or how and what happened to them but she could see that something was now happening, and she assumed this was the machine turning itself off. So she navigated her way quickly back through this pyramid, back out into the desert, and quickly headed across that desert, following her footsteps back the direction she came. Until after some time, of rushing back across the desert. She could see that orb, and she noticed that the orb appeared larger than it had been when she came through. And so she assumed that perhaps the orb had been getting larger and larger ever since the portal opened. Maybe that was how it was going to spread through Earth. And she hoped that now her change would make it so this portal would shrink back down again. And she dashed through the portal, back out into the woodland, into that clearing. And the wizard stood up from sitting down and walked over to Meg. And Meg said that she's done it. She's turned off the switch. And the wizard said that it'll take a little while for the portal to shrink back down and close. But they can just sit down while that happens to make sure that it looks like it's closing. And so they sit down together. Milton comes up, rests his head on Meg's lap. Meg gently strokes Milton while they sit, watching that portal and noticing that that portal does slowly seem to be shrinking. And after some hours, as the sun here is beginning to set, the portal has shrunk to just a point of light before that point of light vanishes, almost in a blink of an eye. And the wizard creates a light above his hand and guides Meg and Milton back through the woods and back out to the farm and walks Meg all the way back to her cabin. And Meg invites the wizard in for a cup of tea. And is intrigued by this wizard and wants to learn more about them. Learn what they do, how they do it. What abilities they have how old they are, and is incredibly interested 
to have this opportunity to meet someone new. She rarely encounters anyone new, living every day pretty much the same as every previous day. Just occasionally being in the presence of others, but rarely talking to others. And now there's this one individual who's so intriguing and different and curious. And over a cup of tea, they engage in conversation. And the wizard shares about how there are some things they can control and do, and other things they can't. They can't fix things that are broken using magic. But they can influence other things. They can hear the plants and animals communicating. They can touch a tree and have a sense of what that tree is communicating. They can touch the ground. And the grass will communicate through their touch. A bird could land on their hand. And they can understand that bird. They can influence an increase in rainfall. They can encourage it to be drier. But they're not able to do some things that people might assume that they could. That they live for thousands of years and see change over those thousands of years. And that they can encourage a path for how things develop. But they can't fix what is already broken. And that their main role is as a protector of nature. And there are many wizards, and they can take on many forms. They can take on the form of anything in nature. They can take on the form of the wind, of the rain, of grass, of trees. They can take on the form of different animals. And here they've just taken on the form of a human. And after engaging in conversation for a while, the wizard leaves. And Meg feels that she's made a new friend. As they agree to see each other again. Because Meg feels the conversation was so interesting, the knowledge the wizard has. And that night, with Milton sleeping at the end of the bed, Meg comfortably and relaxed drifts and floats, so peacefully, so calmly asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And it's a sleep story about finding yourself walking into a vast, overgrown city. And this city has 
been largely reclaimed by nature. And it's about a hundred years after the Great Reset. And as you walk through this city, you can almost notice the echoing sounds of your footsteps reverberating around the buildings. The silence in the city, with no sounds of other people. You can notice the way some of the tall skyscrapers have partially fallen and are leaning on other buildings where the green plant life has eroded through those buildings and cracked and crumbled at the stonework. And from time to time, you hear the sound of crumbling and the occasional sound of falling stones as the plants continue to reclaim the city. And you see parked cars haphazardly down the streets, almost embedded in place by vines and grasses. And in the distance, you can notice some deer grazing in the middle of the street and looking up you can see some birds flying high overhead and you walk down the main street with the tall towers around you of those decaying skyscrapers admiring the peace, the calmness of the environment, while also curious about what this place perhaps looked like before the Great Reset. And as you walk, so you are gathering up some supplies, and so you head into some of the buildings along the street, scour them for different items. You notice the way as the sun begins to set, that the sun sets almost perfectly in line with the main street. creating an orange glow and deep, long shadows stretching out behind you. And as the sun is setting, you head into a sturdy-looking building that looks like it was once some kind of shopping mall. You walk into that building. You hear the echoing of your footsteps on the marble floor. And you can see how far nature has reclaimed into the shopping mall. And notice the glass domed roof is largely broken, with vines hanging down. And plant life creeping along the ceiling, down the walls. And you head to the middle of the shopping mall. You head down some steps. And find your way down to the lower level. 
and right in the middle of the shopping mall. With the broken glass dome overhead, you can gaze up and see the sky. And right below the dome, where when it rains, the rain can fall down to the ground below. This area right beneath the dome is lush plant life, almost like a meadow in the middle of a shopping mall. And you set up a tent in this shopping mall meadow. You set up a small campfire near the tent. And you settle down. Cook yourself some food. And eat that food. And then you have a little bit more food. And drink some water. Before lying down and gazing up. as the night sky begins to appear overhead, seeing the stars as you gaze up, as they travel across the sky, as that sky gets darker and darker, enjoying the twinkling of those stars, the sound of the crackling fire, Drifting and floating so peacefully in your mind while gazing up. And listening to how quiet the environment is. Before heading into the tent. Closing up the zip of the tent. And settling down and drifting and floating peacefully asleep. And the next morning, you awaken, unzip the tent, and feel the freshness of the air, the slight coolness to each breath that you take of that air. You reignite the fire. Have yourself some breakfast. Eating until you're satisfied. Feeling so peaceful and calm here. But knowing that you're just passing through. That since the great reset, the world has become an increasingly calming and quiet place. And you're too young to remember any of what the world was like before the Great Reset. And you've never known anyone who's old enough to have known what the world was like before the Great Reset. Occasionally you stumble across buildings full of books and you'll look through those books and you'll learn and see photos of what different places used to look like. But you've never been able to find out really what it was like. And so you cover over the fire, pack up your tent.
head back out of this shopping mall and continue your journey through this city. And as you approach the end of this main street, you head down a side street, and at the far end of that street, you see a very different style of building with a domed roof, pillars out the front of the building, many steps up to the entrance of the building that contrasts greatly with the very rectangular, tall skyscraper buildings. You decide to head in and explore. One advantage of this world is that there is rarely a hurry. You can have an idea of somewhere that you would like to go, but most people are rarely in a hurry to get there. People just amble along and live in small little communities and occasionally people will go out exploring and everyone learns early in life about nature, about survival, about how to create fire how to find food and water, how to navigate by the stars, how to use the sun and the moon. And whenever anyone encounters anyone else they've never seen before, Usually these other people are incredibly friendly, just wanting to share knowledge. And they'll tell stories about where they've travelled from, what they've seen on their journeys. And measurements are usually given in days, or partial days, so that you have an idea of how far away something is, how long it would take to walk there. And a skill which is highly prized and taught as being very important from a very young age is the skill of patience. of conserving energy, relaxing, of respecting nature and the environment, allowing yourself to patiently wait and you continue to head to this old building And as you get closer to the old building, you can see the way the vines are wrapped up and around the pillars. The way nature has been encroaching around the building, almost like a giant wave of green has struck the building and started to envelop this building. And you head into the building. And the building is quite dark on the inside. And so you light a torch 
and head in with a torch. And as you move that torch around so you can hear the flame dancing on the end of the torch. And you can notice the way the light of the torch dances and bounces around the inside of this building, in the rooms that you head into. Each echoey step that you take. And as you walk around inside this building, so you notice there are large paintings on the walls, some damaged by water, but some managing to have stood the test of time, some in golden frames that look as shiny and reflective to this torchlight now as they probably were when the pictures were set within those frames. And as you cross one of the rooms, you notice in the middle of the room a plinth, and on that plinth seems to be the most majestic marble horse with one leg raised up, its head raised, and a person sat on its back, with their straight back, looking so confident. Do you reach out and touch that marble, feeling how soft and cool that marble feels? And after exploring in here, you head back out and continue your journey. You head beyond this city, following a very straight, overgrown road away from the city. And way off in the distance, you can see what looks like smaller structures of perhaps a town, maybe a day's walk from the city. And so you head in the direction of the town. way over there on the horizon, as the sun gently travels across the sky. And a couple of times during your journey, you stop, you have something to eat, until you feel satisfied. And know that you've eaten the right amount for now, and then you pack up, cover over the fire, and continue your journey, always being respectful to the environment around you as you go, and as you approach this small town as night is approaching, and the sun has just dipped over the horizon, and there's just the glow of sunlight gently illuminating the night sky from below the horizon. You think you have this sense that you noticed something move against the backdrop of the very dark red sky. 
and so you continue to walk in that direction. And it's been many months since you last encountered a person. And so you're curious whether there are some people living here. And as you reach the edge of town, so you notice a glow coming from a building. And you head over towards that glow where you hear some voices speaking softly. You slowly approach the building and head into the building. So those voices getting louder and louder. And then you notice that there's some people sat around a campfire in this building. You introduce yourself. And they, in a friendly way, respond to you and invite you over. And you head over and relax down on a space next to one of the people. And as you relax down on that space, you look around to see what these people are like. And you notice one of the people looks so old. And you introduce yourselves to each other. And then you learn that this elderly person is 117 years old. And this fascinates you. This is the first time you've ever met someone who's old enough to have been alive before the Great Reset. And you share your curiosity and you explain you've never met anyone that old before. And the person explains that they were a teenager when the Great Reset happened. When a giant solar flare struck the planet And all the electrics fizzled and popped and cracked. Satellites fell from the sky. And they explained that prior to the Great Reset, society was based largely on electronic technology that most cars that people owned had electronics that there were devices that you could communicate with people through over long distances that there were ways of looking up any information about the world, that it was an incredible time, but that when this giant solar flare struck, the sky lit up so beautifully with greens and blues and other colours dancing in the sky every single night and that those colours danced in the sky night after night for weeks but at the same time all electronics were destroyed and most money was digital, 
and a lot of other money was stored in bank vaults, which were sealed using digital locks. And a lot of the technology that you could use to try and break into bank vaults were digital or electrical. And the impact on the planet and the fact that it impacted all of the countries of the planet at the same time meant that it was too big an issue that went on for too long to be able to tackle that issue and recover from what had happened. And that initially there was panic and there was people wanting to somehow have the issue fixed. But within a few months, people's attitudes had changed. People started discovering a certain level of peace and freedom from the new lifestyles they could develop. Many had to learn new skills. Communities started working together to support their local community. Farms started creating food for their local community. Those in the community who were able to do so went and helped on those farms to create the food for the others. And life for everyone slowed right down and became far more fulfilling. And as people got used to not having a lot of the technology that they used to have. The motivation and the effort to try to recreate the old world where people would travel long distances, often remaining still for much of those long distances in vehicles just to try and go to work, to earn some money, to afford to keep a roof over your head and food in your belly and in your family's belly and to afford to be able to take time off and have holidays where you could slow your life down for a short period of time before ending up back in the hustle and bustle as it was often referred to of daily life. And although some people really wanted things to go back to how they were, many others liked how things had become they started to get used to how things had become. A more relaxed way of life. And within a few years, as people had gained many new skills, and everyone was becoming comfortable and confident at knowing how to survive for themselves, they became more comfortable with venturing from their community. And a lot of people decided to become nomadic wanderers, wandering perhaps alone or with a, a few others, exploring, they might decide one day, that they would love to see the ocean and so they would head in the direction of the ocean 
and they would wander for months. Settling down every night, wherever they happened to be, until eventually they would arrive at the ocean. And perhaps after a while at the ocean, maybe the seasons begin to turn, the weather begins to shift, and they would decide they would like to head somewhere else. And so it became common for many people to begin to wander to warmer environments as colder weather set in, and wander to cooler environments as warmer weather set in. And as people became skilled at survival, at being able to live off the land, to live in harmony with nature. Life became more relaxing. People stopped fighting over resources as people knew that they could live off the land wherever they were. And within a generation, the attitude to the situation had totally transformed. And the average person had gained more knowledge about nature, about the environment, about health, about surviving, about medicines, than the average person had had before the Great Reset. And there remained some settlements and communities but people had the freedom to carve out the type of lifestyle that they wanted. And you find it interesting listening to this person who had lived through the Great Reset. And one of the other people sat around the fire said that they enjoy encouraging talk of the way things were, so that they can remember the stories from the elders of life before the Great Reset. And as it gets later and later, so you pitch up your tent nearby to the fire as these others all settle down in their sleeping spaces and you settle down in your tent you begin to gently drift and flow to sleep and as you drift and flow to sleep your brain begins to process your experiences. Processing the journey you've been on. Processing meeting these people, hearing the stories of the Great Reset. And while your brain is processing this, you begin to have a sense of building and you're gathering up stones and you're building yourself a shelter and you build it up, placing one stone on top of another, 
placing stones next to stones, going and gathering more stones and placing those next to the others. And then after a while you step back and look at your shelter and decide that it's not yet big enough. And so you go and gather up even more stones from the environment. You build up that shelter, larger and larger, to a more sturdy frame, a more bulky frame. And you step back and you look at it and decide that it's still isn't quite right yet. So you make a few changes, you go and gather some more stones. You continue to take those stones and build up that shelter. Feeling almost like a compulsion to build that shelter up with those stones. Feeling pleasure in what you're creating knowing that you know when you'll be able to step back. Look at yourself and know that it's just right. That it's just the right size. And so you keep stepping back, looking at what you've been creating and then gathering up more stones, building that shelter up. Until eventually, after a period of time, you finally complete that shelter. You step back and take a look, and you think how beautiful that shelter is looking back at you. the size and shape of that shelter. And you start working on the inside. And as you work on the inside, you create an unusual room, a room full of cupboards. And every time you have something that needs placing somewhere, you open a cupboard door and place that inside that cupboard. And you find from time to time that a number of the doors are open where objects have been placed inside those cupboards. So from time to time throughout the day, you go and close those cupboard doors. And as you gather up more items from the day. You place those in more cupboards. And you leave the doors open at the time you place them in the cupboards. So that you know during the day which cupboards are used. And the ones that are closed are yet to be used. And then when you've done a section of cupboards, of filling those cupboards, and you'd recognise the pattern of which cupboards you're about to close, you close those cupboards, and then fill the next cupboards. And every morning, you notice the cupboards are empty, ready to fill again. And you realise that there's a certain connection somehow between those cupboards and a higher realm. But you don't fully know or understand what that connection is. Just that every day in this stone-built house, 
those large numbers of cupboards are closed. And every day in that stone-built house, you open the cupboards one by one, as you have something to place in each cupboard. And throughout the day, when a certain number of cupboards have been filled, you close those cupboards and move on to the next cupboards. And then every night, all those cupboards are closed and emptied, and you wake up every day, ready to do the same again. And what you find as day goes into day and week goes into week, is that those cupboards need filling less frequently, that you become more choosy over what you feel the need to place in a cupboard. And so you use the cupboard less and less. But those that you do use are empty by the next day, ready to be filled again. And then one day, in this dream, you head out of your stone house, you head down to a nearby lake, you walk right up to the water's edge, hearing that crunching, slight squelching sound as you walk all the way to the edge of the water, the sound of that water gently lapping on the shore. And while you're gathering up some water, you hear a voice of someone introducing themselves. And you look up and over at them. And you see them just sat there on a stone on the edge of this lake. playing a drum, drifting in and out of their own reverie. And they tell you that they can help you connect deeper with yourself to the level where you can create inner changes and growth to be who you want to be and how you want to be. And you find this curious. And they ask you to come up, sit next to them on the stone. They place the drum down beside them. They tap it once and say, just focus all of your attention on that sound. As it rings out and see if you can notice when that sound has completely gone. And you focus all of your attention on that sound until you can no longer hear it. And they say that they can help you if you want to learn, and you respond that you really want to learn. But you say, but I don't know what I have to do. And this person says that it's common for people to say that they don't know what they have to do. But it's actually incredibly easy to do the right 
thing. That the last person they spoke to said, I don't know what to do. So they explained what it is you need to do. And with curiosity you ask what this was. And they say, well, I told the person that all you have to do is just sit there on that stone listening to the sound of my voice. And as you sit there on that stone, listening and following along to the sound of my voice, you can notice how from time to time you breathe in and out. And each time that you breathe out, you can drift that little bit deeper inside and that you'll notice that you're beginning now to drift inside. Because as you breathe out, so your shoulders will begin to gently relax. But you may not at first notice that your shoulders are beginning to relax. But as they do relax, your eyelids will begin to feel heavy. Your eyes will feel heavy. The eyes, the eyelids will close. And you'll begin to drift deeper into the experience. And as you drift deeper into the experience, Sounds around you may begin to fade away, just becoming less important as you begin to focus more on me, focus more on the sound of my voice, the way my voice can seem to perhaps just reverberate in one ear and through the other. And I don't know whether while you listen to me and begin to drift deeper and deeper into the experience, whether you'll find that the sound of my voice seems to draw you in deeper to the experience, or whether it's the spaces between my words. And while you begin to breathe in that way, you may notice how your breathing begins to soften, and slow down. How time seems to almost soften and slow and relax deeper and deeper. How you can now begin to feel a deepening, and I don't know whether that'll be a warmth on the cheeks or around the face, or a softening of those muscles, or a relaxing of the neck, the shoulders, the arms. Maybe the arms become heavier Maybe you begin to not notice those arms as your attention drifts and floats deeper down through your body. And I don't know whether the left hand, left right there will become heavier, 
than the right hand left right over there, or whether the right hand left right over there will become heavier than the left hand left right there. But as the right hand becomes heavier and heavier, it won't be the wrong hand. And I don't know whether the right hand is the left one or the right one, whether the left one is right or whether the right one is wrong. Maybe the right one is left right there as the right one to go deeper and more relaxed. Or maybe that one is the wrong one. But it's your right to decide without even thinking about it which hand helps you drift right on deeper and deeper into the experience. And as a part of you drift deeper and deeper into the experience, so another part of you can be left behind to focus on relaxing more and more. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper while you relax or whether as you relax deeper and deeper, you'll find yourself floating and drifting into a reverie. But as you begin to comfortably drift and dream and go deeper into the experience, only do so at the rate and speed that is right for you. Don't go any deeper than is comfortable for you at any moment. And don't go deeper and deeper just because you're following what I say. But only go deeper and deeper at the rate and speed that you decide to do. And while you go deeper, and more relaxed into the experience. You'll find that your mind can begin to drift and float onto a different level of existence. And I don't know whether it'll start with just a blackness in mind or some flashes of colour, maybe some shapes or movement, or it'll start in some other way, but only you can know and discover that now, what it is that I'm guiding you through here as we sit on the stone is that inner experience of connecting with your deeper self. And as you connect with your deeper self, you can find that place in your mind where you can relax, where you can be walking towards a tree and as you walk towards that tree, you can notice what the sky looks like. You can notice the feeling of the air, perhaps a breeze or the temperature of that air on your face. And then as you reach the tree, you can run your fingers around the bark of the tree. And at an unexpected moment, you can touch a part of the bark where all of a sudden the tree and the bit of land that you're stood on begins to lower deeper and deeper into the experience. And as that bit of land and the tree lowers deeper and deeper, it'll go down from level five 
on the surface to level four, three, two, one, all the way, all the way, deeper and deeper. And my voice can go with you through the experience. And my voice can take on the sound of the wind, maybe each footstep that you take, or maybe something entirely different, or maybe you'll just hear my words, or drift off elsewhere with them in the background, as you go deeper and deeper, but only go deeper with each outbreath that you take, and relax more and more with each in-breath, as you begin to walk towards a chair, and as you walk to that chair, and relax down in that chair, I don't know whether your body will become so deeply and comfortably relaxed, that even if a part of you was trying in vain to fight the urge to relax, all that does is deepens the experience, allows you to increase your focus on relaxing in your own way, not in any way that I dictate but in the way that's right for you, where your mind perhaps wanders away from my voice, while just responding to it in the background as you gently drift deeper and relax in that chair. And as you relax in that chair, you can have a sense of a panel moving from the side across your eyes. And then on that panel, you can notice certain shapes and sensations and movement as a whole new reality begins to form. A reality that's connected with your deep, unconscious now, where you can find yourself walking down some steps, and as you walk down those steps, and then turn left, and continue to walk down, and then turn left, and continue to walk down, and then turn left and continue to walk down, you can find yourself back at the top. And so this time you walk down those steps and you turn right and walk down those steps and you turn left and walk down those steps and you can see beneath you the steps you started on, realizing you're now upside down to those steps. And so you walk down some steps, you walk across a bridge, you walk up some steps and down some more, before turning left then right, then left, then left, then right, following steps everywhere you go, finding yourself at the top of a tower, realizing you've reached the bottom. And as confusion sets in, while you realize that this land seems to be strange that you can follow steps and find yourself elsewhere. You decide instead to step off of the steps, 
onto a bridge. And you follow this figure of eight bridge. And as you follow that figure of eight bridge, walking around and following it around the curve and then walking around, you find that you're back where you started, but on the underside of the bridge that you were on top of. And you walk around again, around the curve of this figure of eight, following it around and around. And you find yourself back where you started, on the top of this figure of eight. And you realize that this strange bridge is an infinite bridge that you walk along. And when you get back to where you started, you're on the bottom and you walk along. And when you get back to where you started, you're on the top. And when you're on the bottom, you step off the bridge onto a platform and you follow that platform through an archway. You follow some steps beyond the archway and then turn left, up some steps, right, down some steps, left, up some steps, right, down some steps, left, down some steps, left, down some steps, right, up some steps, and find yourself back where you started. And you realize that this land seems to have no up, nor down, no left, nor right, no backward, nor forward. Just here and now, and when you're standing at the top of some steps, from one perspective it's the bottom, from another perspective you're on the ceiling, from another perspective you're on the floor, from another perspective you're left, and another perspective you're right. And from your perspective you feel like you're just stood at the top of some steps. And whenever you walk, you find yourself there. And when asked where you are, you say, I am here, in the middle of nowhere. And this person explains that this is what they said to that previous person. And they said this with a little smile as they were aware that you followed along as if they were talking to you. And they said, and now where you are, you can listen to me. And as you comfortably begin to drift deeper into the experience, you can begin to learn something about what it is you want to connect with, about what it is you want to achieve. How you can hold the appropriate weight of the world, but not holding beyond that appropriate amount. How your perspective can shift as you walk around that inner cube, that inner world made up of steps, bridges, twists and turns. That from wherever you are, everything makes sense. But when you look beyond where you are, you realize that you're only where you are because of your perspective telling you that you're at the top of some steps, or at the bottom of some steps. That if you were anyone else, you would think different about that situation. 
And you can learn so deeply about this in a way that perhaps others don't realize. And perhaps you don't even realize on a conscious level. Because this learning is connecting deep within you. And this person goes on to say that one day somebody went somewhere. And when they went somewhere, they asked if anybody was around. And nobody said anything. And somebody asked nobody what anything means. And nobody said that someone somewhere wants to know something about nothing. But they don't want to discover nothing anywhere. They want to discover it somewhere. And so somewhere is the place to explore. And nobody said that anyone can discover what is somewhere. And they explained in a very vague way. And somebody went somewhere to make that discovery. And it can all make sense. And after a little while, you find yourself being guided back to being aware of sitting on that rock. And that person taps that drum once more as you follow that sound of the drum tap drifting back to being with that person on the rock. They then say it's time to get up from the rock, to head back to that stone house, and to fall asleep and find yourself home. And so you stand up. You leave the edge of the lake. You head home to that stone house. You relax down and drift asleep in that stone house. And sleep deeper and deeper. And then in the morning, you awaken you pack your things away. You eat some breakfast until you feel full and satisfied. Before saying goodbye and continuing your journey. Walking beyond this town. And as you continue beyond this town. So you head in to some woodland and you enjoy the change of environment, the change of the sounds around you as you walk into the woodland. And you notice this bird of paradise, so beautiful in the sky, flying and flitting between the trees, sometimes seeming to almost hover. You hear its singing and the distant singing of other birds. And you follow that bird as it seems to almost hover to keep your attention before then heading on a little way further. And you follow that bird as it flies 
around deeper into the woodland and then settles down on a branch and seems to be singing and facing a specific direction as if to try and draw your attention to something. And you gaze off in that direction and you notice something among the undergrowth. You head closer and closer to it and realize there's a young tiger cub lying on the ground, breathing heavily. You notice that it's got a splinter in its paw and that it's breathing heavily and lying still to try to reduce any discomfort. And you approach it carefully and you gently stroke it while talking softly to it and reassuringly to it before pulling out that splinter noticing the burst of discomfort pass through that little tiger cub you then wrap up a makeshift bandage around the tiger cub's foot and you sit with that tiger cub which now rests its head so gently on your lap and you just gently stroke the cub hearing it purring resting on your lap and you notice that this tiger cub seems to be all alone that over many hours of you resting there with this cub no adult tiger seems to appear and so you go and find some food for that tiger cub you make sure it's eaten as much as it needs to be able to grow big and healthy and over the next few days you stay in this area camping here, looking after this tiger cub until its paw is better and then when it's better and it's running around and it seems more independent you decide to leave and continue on your journey exploring the land finding strange new places gaining new knowledge from each place you visit absorbing knowledge in the books, in the libraries you discover, learning from artefacts that you find, from those people you encounter on your journey. And as you leave, so the tiger cub seems to follow. And at first, you try to encourage it to go its own way, but then realize that its own way, it has decided, is your way, that it's decided to tag along and join you on your journey. And so you continue your journey of discovery and as weeks turn into months and months turn into years, so that bond with this tiger deepens, becomes more profound as the two of you continue this journey together, becoming lifelong friends. And one day, Many years later, when you're much older, you settle down in your tent, 
thinking back over a lifetime of experiences that you've had up to this point, those you've met, what you've learned and gained from your journey, what you feel you will learn and gain if you were to do this differently and live this again and again. You look back over realizing that you've changed and developed in your dreams, often meeting that wise person in your dreams who guides you through learning experiences where you find yourself often dreaming about being in that stone house you built many years earlier. And this night, like many others, you settle down with the tiger, listening to the crackling fire as it burns down to embers, feeling its gentle warmth, a slight breeze on your cheeks as you drift and float so peacefully and so comfortably relaxed asleep so just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax and as you begin to comfortably drift asleep. I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And while I tell this sleep story, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep, you can just have a sense of a person walking through a meadow. And as this person walks through this meadow, they're just ambling along. They can notice the clouds overhead, noticing the way that they're moving gently across the sky. They can notice the way the grass and the plants move in the meadow as the wind occasionally blows a little breeze. They can feel that breeze on their cheeks and each footstep that they take and yet at the same time they have a vague sense of being lost but they're comfortable with this they've just never really explored this area before they kind of know the route they came they know they can safely find their way back but they don't really know where they are right now. And so they continue to just roam around exploring, enjoying the environment, taking in the sounds, the sights, the smells of the different flowers. And as they explore in this meadow, so they can notice a curious bird flying off in the distance. And the way that bird is singing seems to almost lull them towards it. And so they start to follow, they start to head towards that bird. And as they head comfortably towards that bird, so they notice the way that it occasionally seems to turn around and manage to hover gently in the air as if to check that they're still following before turning back and carrying on flying. And after a while, they follow that bird towards the tree line at the far side of this meadow and then into the woodland. And as they follow that bird into the woodland, so the bird's song seems to almost echo. And they can tell which direction that song's coming from. 
They follow that sound of the bird deeper and deeper into the woodland. And they're curious about this bird. And eventually, deep in the woodland, they find a fallen down tree and an ever so slight clearing where that tree has fallen, where some sunlight is breaking into the centre of this woodland. And that bird is just sitting there, jumping around a little bit, and the person heads over, slowly, carefully, quietly, towards that bird. Not wanting to disturb that bird, not wanting to scare that bird off, make it fly away. And it's a small little bird, the most beautiful wings, the most beautiful plumage. And they sit down gently next to the bird. Sitting down on the trunk of that fallen down tree. And as they sit down, so the bird gently hops over to them and hops up onto their leg. And as it hops up onto their leg, so they begin to have this sense of almost like an energy field emanating from the bird. And then within a moment, they start to have this almost psychic connection with the bird. And they realise this bird is communicating with them. And somehow they understand the bird. And so they are looking at that bird on their leg. And that bird is looking back at them. And they can hear with their ears that the bird is singing. But with their mind, they can hear the bird talking. And they can understand that talking. And the bird says that I'm a life bond bird. I find a human and I connect with that human. And there are various life bond animals, some dogs, some cats, and some other animals, where we bond for life with a human. We can communicate psychically with that human. But what I'm here for now isn't just to bond with you, it's to ask you for help. And the person thinks to themselves, what help could you possibly require from me? And the bird says that there's an unsettled dragon that's looking for peace that requires your help. And the person was curious about this, while at the same time being unsure, not really believing in dragons. But at the same time, they didn't believe that a bird could talk, let alone be psychic, until a moment ago. And the alternative to believing that this is real was something they'd rather not believe right now. So they ask the bird where they have to go, what they have to do. And the bird flies off of their leg and begins to fly deeper and deeper into the woodland. And they walk along following that bird as it easily weaves and dodges branches while they're trying hard to push 
through those branches and deep in the woodland they discover a tall shiny black obelisk with symbols on all the sides and the bird lands in a tree near this obelisk and the person asks what they're supposed to do what does this mean and the bird says reach out and just touch the obelisk so they reach out and gently with their fingertips they touch that obelisk and as they do a blue light begins to illuminate the symbols on the obelisk then almost like an electric effect begins to travel up from the ground up the sides up to the top with a crackling sparking sound before firing from the top up high into the sky and the person notices as it fires high into the sky that it seems to be separating the clouds almost puncturing through the sky and a dome begins to appear around them and the person looks up and watches as that dome is arcing overhead arcing and lowering down to the ground almost like somebody's pouring chocolate on top of a cake and watching it pour around the sides and they watch as that dome forms all around them and as soon as the dome has formed so the obelisk goes quiet and the dome has a glow to it and then moments later that dome begins to turn dark almost like night time is setting in and stars begin to appear on that dome and the person gazes up thinking it almost looks like gazing up at a night sky and then as that night time descends on this area so the woodland seems to evaporate and fade away with just the obelisk standing and in front of the person they can see a slow deep breathing dragon the most powerful looking green dragon with strong wings and legs just lying there curled on the ground its head resting across the ground with deep puffs with each breath and a warmth from each breath and the person begins to walk towards that dragon a little apprehensively at first and the bird flies to the person's shoulder stands on the person's shoulder as they walk towards that dragon and as they reach the dragon they notice its eyes gently look up in their direction and the person picks up that this dragon appears lost as the dragon's eyes look back down again and they gently run their hand down the neck of the dragon they can feel the warmth emanating from the neck of that dragon they can feel the scales under their fingertips, under the palm of their hand. They run their hand all the way down to the body and down to 
the shoulder of one of the wings. They ask the bird, how can I help this dragon? And the bird says that this dragon needs to find peace. That for some time now, they've been overcome with anger and with things that they have done while angry. And it wasn't their fault that they were angry. They were controlled by an evil wizard. And they're still being controlled by that evil wizard. And that's why they appear so despondent here. They know what they're going to do at any given moment. And the person asks, well, why didn't they attack me if they're so angry? And the bird says that it's likely because the wizard hasn't registered that there's anyone here as far as the wizard's concerned. This dragon's here in this land, just resting here before they're going to send it to attack more villages and attack more villagers and be their weapon of destruction. But there are also no humans here in this land. There are various types of beings, but no humans. And so it could be that the wizard just hasn't detected anything about you as a being. And you're here in this land, having accessed it through that obelisk. Where the obelisk has transported you from one location in one realm to another location in another realm. And perhaps that's how you're to defeat the wizard and help to break the curse and bring peace to the dragon. That the wizard can't detect you because you're not of this realm. And so maybe that will give you the element of surprise. And so the person asks where the wizard is. And the bird says the wizard is up in the mountains. And so the person begins trekking away from the dragon, unsure exactly how they're going to defeat the wizard, what they're going to be able to do, but treks away from the dragon. And can just make out the outline of the peaks of the mountains by the lack of starlight, almost like a crooked break in the lower part of the night sky, where the stars just end. And the bird and the person head to the mountains and begin to ascend and they reach a height where the bird says that they can't fly any higher. And so the bird rests on the person's shoulder as they continue ascending higher and higher. And when they're near the peak of the mountain, the person can see what looks like some kind of temple. And there's a glow coming from within the temple. And so they carefully and quietly head into that temple. And they walk quietly as their eyes adapt to that low glow. And as they walk quietly into the temple, they can see symbols around the walls. 
they can see a library of books. And they can notice a wizard chanting over a pool of water. And as they're chanting over that pool of water, so a purple mist is rising from the pool. And as they sneak around to try and get a closer look, while keeping out of the sight of the wizard, they notice that it looks like an image of a village in that pool of water. And the bird telepathically tells the person that the wizard is in the process of connecting the dragon's next destruction with that village. And the person wonders what they could possibly do to help and to stop a wizard when they're just a human. And just then, they have an idea. And they walk out, very confidently, talking to face that wizard. And the wizard is taken aback, taken by surprise. The wizard didn't hear anyone coming, didn't sense anyone coming, and had never met a human before. And the person carried on talking, while the wizard is still wondering who this being is, and not understanding them. And they walked towards that wizard. And as they got nearer and nearer to the wizard, they were passing by some pillars that had bowls on top with coal in the bowls and flames coming out of those bowls. And these bowls seem to be around the outside of that pool of water as if to make this area somehow magical or sacred or special in some way. And as they walked past one of the bowls, They intentionally knocked the pillar in the direction of the pool of water. And the bowl and the coals fell into that pool of water. The purple mist turned to flames and then burnt out. And the pool started looking just like a pool of ordinary water that was bubbling with the heat of the coals and the wizard screamed out in anger as the person ran out the way and hid behind a pillar and the wizard began searching angrily for this person and the bird was still across the other side of the room, keeping out of sight. But that meant that the bird was able to have a view of what's going on. They were small enough to not be noticed, and all of the wizard's attention was on trying to find the human, not on trying to sense a small animal in the room. But that bird having a telepathic connection with the human meant that they were able to always keep the person one step ahead of the wizard as the wizard explored and tried to find the human. And when they got the chance, they ran out, they knocked another pillar, knocking more coals and flame into the pool. and then headed off and hid. 
and then they ran out and did it with the third pillar. And this time the wizard managed to catch a glimpse of them and fired out a burst of flames from the palm of their hand in the direction of the person who managed to avoid it and get hidden again. And this person knew this was just a temporary fix, that all this was doing was preventing the dragon getting angry now. They hadn't yet figured out how to help that dragon find peace. But they hoped that perhaps all of the control this wizard had over the dragon is done via that pool. So if they can ruin the pool, maybe they can stop the wizard having the control, even if the dragon is still under the wizard's spell, at least for a while. And then they ran past and knocked down the last pillar with the last coals and flames falling in the pool. And then they grabbed the book the wizard was using to cast the spell. They threw that into the pool. And the wizard ran out and lunged at them and pushed that person over. The person rolled on the ground. The wizard came over and held the hand out while standing on the person's chest with one foot. And the hand had flames twirling around it. And the wizard looked incredibly angry. And the person couldn't understand what the wizard was saying, but imagined that this wizard was asking who they are, what they're doing here, why they've done what they've done. And then as they drew back their hand, ready to thrust it forward and send a pulse of flames at the person, the bird came out of nowhere and flew at the wizard's face, blocking the view of the wizard with its wings. And as the wizard moved their hands to brush away at the bird, the person rolled out the way and ran out of the temple and back into the mountains. The bird came out and joined them as the two of them tried disappearing into the night here on the mountains. They could hear that wizard following them. They started heading down the mountain with the sound of the wizard behind them, continuing to head deeper and deeper down that mountain, heading back towards the dragon, wondering how they can help this dragon, what they can do. The bird was right that the human had an element of surprise, but the person didn't know what to do next. They just knew that they had to get back to the dragon and away from that wizard. And eventually they managed to make it all the way back to the dragon. And they could see that dragon still lying there despondent on the ground. And they went over to the dragon. They tried looking at the dragon in the eye and asking for, what can I do to help? But the dragon never responded. Then the wizard appeared and was walking towards them. And the person tucked themselves behind the dragon and was walking along the side of the dragon, keeping the dragon between themselves and the wizard. They could see as they peered over the dragon, the wizard's hand with a flame around it. And the wizard was still talking and saying things the person couldn't understand. 
and then as they were walking around the dragon, sliding a hand along the dragon while they walked, suddenly the dragon flinched and tucked just into the back of one of the dragon's legs was what looked like a really sharp splinter. And it was as the person touched that splinter that caused the dragon to flinch. And so they carefully took a look at this splinter and realised there was a very slight bit of purple smoke seeming to be coming from the splinter, coming from the wound. And they pulled with all their might to pull that splinter out from the dragon. And as they were pulling and pulling on that splinter, so the wizard was walking around the dragon. And the dragon was becoming more and more tense and beginning to shake and vibrate as if it was causing it pain having that splinter being pulled. And that wizard was walking around the dragon. And then all of a sudden, the splinter came out in the person's hand as they stumbled back and fell to the ground. And as it came out, so the dragon let out a massive roar, stretching its neck, its head, and a burst of intense fire travelled from its mouth, seeming to shoot across the land as far as the eye could see. And then the dragon went quiet, its head fell down, and that wizard was nowhere to be seen. And then the dragon did a few deep, comfortable breaths. And the night began to change to day. And then the dragon's breathing normalised. And it sat itself up, gently. And it turned its head to the person. Bowed its head to them and let them stroke its nose while looking them in the eye. And the person realised that they've now just helped this dragon find inner peace that they were seeking. And not only have they helped the dragon to find inner peace and to no longer be unsettled, but they've prevented any further harm happening to villages or villagers or anyone else in this land from that wizard. And the bird flew and landed on their shoulder and said it's time for us to head back to the woodland. You've shown that you're worthy of being supported and worthy of my life bond. And I'll always be there for you. Sometimes you'll just hear me. Other times you'll see me, but you'll know I'm always there. And we can always communicate mind to mind. And the person walked back to the obelisk. Touched that obelisk. As they did. So the sky began to change and everything around them began to change and they found themselves back in that woodland and as they found themselves back in that woodland so the ground began to rumble and the obelisk began to lower down into the ground and once it had fully lowered into the ground, it was as if the ground was swallowing it as that ground closed in on top of it. 
And this person had this feeling almost like the trees were singing and talking to him. As the two of them head back out into the meadow. And the person said to the bird, I don't know where I am. I don't know the best way home. And the bird said, The sound of my voice will guide you. You can just follow the sound of my voice, and you'll be on the right path. And then the bird flew off. And the person had this sense of the sound of the bird's voice, and followed that sound through the meadow, and found their way back, and headed all the way home. And once home, they settled down, thinking about the bizarre experience they'd had when they just went out for a walk in a place they'd never been before. And they felt that perhaps it was some kind of a dream. Maybe they're a bit dehydrated while they're out and about. They were trying to rationalise it and make sense of it. But as they were trying to rationalise it and make sense of it, and they were sat in their back garden. In the evening, as the sun was setting, eating some food, drinking some drink, that bird appeared, landed on the table next to them, and began to telepathically communicate with them. And they realised the whole experience was real and had happened. And that night, they drifted and floated so peacefully asleep, curious about any future adventures that they might embark on with that bird. And what this life bond with this bird means to their future as they comfortably and relaxed drifted asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you continue to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And this sleep story is about a woman called Maria. And Maria, while on holiday to an exotic location, decides to explore the nearby town. And as she heads into that nearby town, so she gets drawn in by the old, old buildings, noticing some of the strange architecture of these buildings. And she walks along a cobbled street and heads down an even narrower street. And she recognises the word above a door as being a foreign word meaning library. And she opens that door. And as soon as she's walked through the door, she's instantly greeted by that calm, quiet, muffled sound of a densely packed library. And with a bit of a thud, she closes the door behind her. And the sound of her footsteps seem to almost just disappear almost as soon as she's taken the step. And there's a certain comfortable silence that she notices in here. And as she begins to look around this library, 
she realizes that many of these books look incredibly old. And she can smell that old book smell. She can't see any staff or any other people anywhere in here. She can just notice that there are some narrow, tall windows. With the light from the sun. Shining through like shards of light illuminating the dust in the air. As those shards of light carefully scan across rugs on the floor. And Maria begins to look at the different books, taking a few books off the shelves, carefully turning those pages, checking the dates of the books and the titles of the books before putting them back onto the shelves. Until after a little while of searching and looking at different books, she notices a really curious looking book. She takes it down off the shelf. She sits down on the floor with that book, resting the book on the floor in front of her. She opens that book. She can feel the thickness of the paper as she turns those pages. And she reads the date in this book, 1648. And she turns a few more pages and she reads the title. And she can understand different languages and can just about piece together what this book says, even though it's in a very old version of the language. And she realizes this book says that it can teach you the knowledge of connecting through time with yourself. And she finds this intriguing and just discovers herself continuing to read. And as she continues to read, so she starts reading about how this book says that the life force or energy can never be created or destroyed. That the universe began with a spark of eternal life. And that spark of eternal life, that initial energy, turned into matter. And each bit of matter contained an element of that eternal spark. And that eternal spark can never be destroyed. It'll either be matter or energy. And as she continued to read, she read it describing how you can connect with the eternal spark and you can follow the eternal spark that's within you back through time. You can follow it back to being able to experience that eternal spark as it was previously, almost like accessing the memories contained within that consciousness. And she realizes that it's almost as if this is talking about past lives. And she continues to read on. 
and it says it's going to teach the reader how to do this, how to connect and access that spark, and then how to follow that back through your life, and then follow it back beyond your life to where that eternal spark existed before you. And after much reading, she came to the section that guided her through a process. And so she read that process. And it was a very simple process to follow. So she went over it a handful of times, reading the process, getting that process in her mind. Before recalling the process to herself to guide herself back. And she remained sat on the floor in this library, that book resting in front of her, the silence of this library. As she started to guide herself through that process, she thought to herself, okay, just take a moment to close your eyes. And take a few comfortable breaths, breathing in and breathing out and breathing out any tension and breathing in relaxation. And after a while of breathing in that way, you can begin to have a sense of walking through a meadow. And it's the most beautiful meadow with flowers swaying gently in the breeze, the colours, the sky overhead, and heading to that grand tree in the centre of the meadow. And on reaching that tree, you can touch that tree, almost like touching the tree of eternal life. And as you touch that tree, so a healing white light can begin to emanate from the tree, spreading through your hands, up to your shoulders, all the way up to the top of your head, and then back down through your body, spreading healing from the top of your head to the tips of your toes softening and relaxing the muscles as it goes, relaxing you deeper and deeper into the experience. And as that healing light spreads through your body, relaxing you deeper and deeper into the experience, so you can have a sense of finding yourself as that bright healing light begins to fade, stood at the top of a grand staircase. And then just walking gently and very slowly down those steps. Going one twentieth of the way deeper and deeper into the experience with each step that you take until you're going to reach the bottom where you can walk along an echoey corridor to a door. Walking down those stairs, going one twentieth of the way deeper, twenty, nineteen, eighteen, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, Thirteen, deeper and deeper. Twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
standing at the bottom of those stairs, walking along that corridor. The sound of each footstep reverberating and echoing as you walk towards that door. And passing through that door, finding yourself in a room of nothingness, a room where there's no up nor down, no left nor right, no backward nor forward, no time. Just here now. Approaching a connection with that deeper consciousness, that deeper inner wisdom, that deeper connection through time with that spark. And then walking through nothingness, unaware of whether you're moving at all, but going through the motions of walking. and then being surrounded by stars seeming to appear from all directions, as if you're floating in space. And with those stars appearing in all directions, noticing that one star in the sky, in that inky blackness, seems to stand out from the others. And almost instinctively feeling a compulsion to reach out for that star. And as you reach for that star and your fingertips seem to touch that light, you find that night sky turn bright white and as that bright white quickly fades you find yourself in a life you don't recognize and you look around yourself and as you look around you discover the most incredible thing that you seem to be seeing through the eyes, hearing through the ears and feeling through the senses of somebody in the past. And you realize that you seem to be in the mind of a past life of yours. And you look around, and you feel almost like you're experiencing a lucid dream, where you're aware, but at the same time it's playing out around you. And you can see cobbled streets, you can hear a horse and cart go past. And as you're walking along the cobbled streets, you come out of a dark alleyway and into a more lit up area with people selling at little market stalls. And you realize it seems like a really old fashioned high street. And as you look around, you have this feeling like it's almost Victorian. And the eyes you're seeing through. The person just seems to be walking down the street. And they purchase some materials from a vendor. And as they purchase the materials, so they touch the cloth. They feel what that feels like under their fingertips. And you feel what that feels like. You notice they seem happy and smiling. And they're talking with an accent that you recognize. 
And you go along with this life for the ride, seeing where this takes you. And then this person heads along a bit further to another stall. They buy some food. And after buying that food, they seem to be working their way back the way they came. You realize they're heading home. And after heading back home, a little bit later on, they seem to settle down in a chair by a fire. And you can hear that gently crackling fire in the background. So you follow the same technique. And you notice those stars appearing around you again. You reach out for that star, that light in the sky. And just as your fingers touch that light, so the light spreads to be bright all around you before disappearing and you find yourself in another strange location. You realize that you're much younger and incredibly fit and active and running around. And you're running over hills. You can see the clouds passing overhead. And the hills are green and lush. And the air is cool. You realize you're in a very mountainous area with these hills and mountains around you. And at the bottom of the hills, you see what looks like a farm. and a horse, and a very basic cart. And you can see some adults working in the fields. And you don't know how far back in time you're seeing, or whether this is just in your mind, or real past lives. And you don't know how you can know but you know that you can learn from these experiences. And so when the opportunity arises, when as this person, you sit down on the grass on one of those hillsides, you have a sense of going through the technique again, reaching for that light, and as the bright light surrounds you and then fades quickly again, you find yourself within giant stone walls. You can feel that the sun is incredibly warm. There's the most beautiful hanging gardens on the walls. the sound of running water around you. Water running down one of the walls as a water feature. And you find as this person, they're heading somewhere and just walking down the street. And it's a different kind of cobbled street. you have this idea that this seems to be a period in history dating back perhaps a few thousand years. And you find as this person that you turn into a large building. And in that large building, you can see scrolls wrapped up and placed stacked in diamond-shaped holes in the walls. Then you head over to one of those holes in the walls. You grab one of the scrolls, 
and you're curious what this person's doing, and this person who is you unrolls that scroll. And you find yourself just instinctively understanding the writing on the scroll. And a part of you, aware of that scroll, and that it's a, an ancient language, is seeing this as potentially a sign that it could be a real past life. Because as you read that scroll, you can recognize the symbols as being a genuine ancient language, but you do seem to be able to understand it as this person as if it's your own native language. And after they read that scroll for a bit, they roll it up, they head over and they sit in a corner, they then unroll it and continue reading. And while they're reading, you decide to see if you can go back even further. And you go through that technique. You see stars all around you. You reach for that light. And as you touch that light, so the light forms around you before fading away and you find yourself with other workers building a pyramid, and you realize that you're in ancient Egypt, and you know that unlike other places, this is definitely somewhere familiar, and definitely somewhere you can be certain about the time, aware that there are some pyramids already built, there are some that you can't see, and there is this one that you're building. And you know that you're perhaps 4,000 years in the past. And so you experience helping and talking with the person alongside you while pulling those stones up the pyramid as others are taking logs and moving them from the back to the front, from the back to the front. Others are pouring some water on the logs. And then, after a while, you and a friend this person who you're talking with, take a break. And while you're taking a break, you head over to grab some lunch. And then you sit and talk with this person. And as usual, you're like an observer on the experience. Almost like that voice in the back of a mind that's observing what you're doing where you're doing something, and then in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, I wonder if I'm doing this right. I wonder what others think of what I'm doing. Later on, I've got to do this. And you're like that voice in the back of the minds of these people whose lives you're sharing. And after a while, you decide to See if you can go back any further. And so you follow that technique. You see that night sky. You reach for that light. That light envelops you. And then fades away. And you find yourself in the most beautiful ancient-looking city. 
and despite it being so ancient, you see what looks like incredible technology you've never seen before. And as you begin to walk around this area, experiencing this through the eyes of this person, seeing these vast, almost perfectly white buildings everywhere, everything so manicured and perfect. And seeing people seemingly so technologically advanced, you realize that you're in ancient Atlantis. And this person wanders around, going about their everyday life, not doing anything specific, just walking around and seeming to take in the environment, like they've just gone out for a walk for a day. And as you walk around with this person, you start to reflect on your experience to this point, reflecting on the different lives you've dropped in on. And you're aware that none of these people are around now. They all had their time and you start to think about the value of these people to each other. About how, in any given moment, none of them knew the fate of their future or of the broader future. None of them knew that you were sharing the experience with them. And while this person sat down and just seemed to be enjoying sitting in a park with beautiful white flowers, blue streams and a lake, the most comfortable sunshine on the skin, some people approached them and the way they responded and interacted made you feel that perhaps this was their family. And so Maria observed with curiosity as this person interacted with their family. And they seemed to appreciate their family so much. When they were looking at different family members, they were attending fully with all of their attention to just that family member in that moment. And you had this sense, this feeling from within them that you were sharing with them, being part of them. that they really appreciated this moment, this life that they have. That whatever else has gone on for them, whatever else might happen in their future, they really appreciate the moment and those around them. And something that you notice while here is that this person places something in a box. The other family members place things in the box. And this person buries that box in the ground. And it's almost like they buried a time capsule. And then this person stands up 
and they look around, and as they look around, Maria recognises a mountain on the horizon, and realises where this location is. That the mountain's a little different nowadays, in modern time, but similar enough that she recognised it. And so, Maria drifted back from the experience. And as she drifted back, she found herself back with those stars and found her way back through time. She was curious whether perhaps she could use this technique to go even further back in the future. And once she found her way back to being in that library, she opened her eyes. She placed that book back where she found it and left the library. And she knew where she wanted to go. And a few days later, she travelled to a location surrounded by islands and she set off on a boat and then after a while of travelling away from the shore on the boat she looked back towards those islands and she recognised the mountains and she travelled around on that boat a little bit, trying to get a sense of how those mountains looked in her mind back then. When she felt she was roughly at the location that she was, when she travelled into those past lives, she lowered an anchor from the boat, suited up into diving gear, dropped off the back of the boat into the water and allowed herself to descend. And as she slowly, carefully descended, breathing in such a calm and peaceful way, aware of the stillness and the slowing down of the environment around her while she descended, through the clear water. She eventually reached the ocean bed. And as she reached the ocean bed, she allowed herself just to sit down on the sea floor. She looked around and she had this sense that she would be able to see the mountain if this was above the surface. She could see that the ocean bed wasn't smooth. There was lots of rocks and different shapes that looked all like it could have been natural, but also from her memory of where she was in that past life. She began to recognise that some of it looked like maybe fallen down buildings which had become overgrown over thousands of years and buried deep under the sea. And she got a shovel, and she dug down gently into the ground. And she noticed after digging for a while that what she was digging through changed from a sand-like substance to a layer that was more like mud. And she continued digging. And then to her surprise, the spade seemed to knock something. And so she uncovered what she'd knocked and found, surprisingly, that that container was still there. So she dug that up, took that up to the surface with her, got back on board the boat. And on the boat, once she'd 
changed back into her normal clothes. She went into the cabin of the boat, placed that container on the table. And she looked at how she could get into it, and she found a way into the container, managed to open it. And as she opened it, it was almost like a puff of air that was trapped within the container, exhaled from the container. And she imagined that that bit of air and any smell that came with it was probably the only time someone in present day had smelt and experienced the air from Atlantis and in the container. She saw a lock of hair and she remembered one of the children placing that lock in there. She took that lock of hair out, gently handling that feeling how soft that hair felt. She found what looked a bit like a rose petal and its waxy smoothness between her fingertips. And she took out all the different items one at a time. And the last item she took out was like a small scroll and she carefully unrolled that and was surprised as she looked at it that she was able to read it, that something about travelling into the past lives had made it so that somehow, almost like a bleeding effect had happened, that she had gained some of the wisdom and knowledge and abilities of those past versions of herself that she had accessed. And she read that scroll and realised that it just contained long-forgotten wisdom about leading life, about where to focus your attention your love, your appreciation. What's important in life that you shouldn't let go of? You should always keep in mind those important things in life. And she continued to read and read that this person was concerned that as a wider society, that the actions of a few were going to lead to the downfall for the many of the entire civilization. And Maria, looking back from the present, is aware that that is what happened, and was aware that some people back then were also aware that a certain fate was approaching. And she read that scroll with intrigue, and something about it resonated deeply with her, about making the most of every moment, really appreciating what you have and those in your life, and how you can enrich the lives of those around you, and how those around you enrich your life. making the most of every single moment. And Maria felt a deep connection with this person who wrote that, and with the message they gave, and the time now that she finds herself in, and what she sees around her and experiences. And she travels back to the shore on her boat, spends a night in a hotel on the nearby island before heading home the next day. And that night, 
as Maria drifts and floats so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. She drifts asleep with thoughts of deep appreciation and love for those in her life. And what she has learned from her experience As she falls so peacefully and comfortably asleep.